All right, I do believe we are live. Hey, 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 people. Welcome to another episode of the Break the Rules live stream. I'm your host, Lev Polyakov, and we are coming at you today to talk about the Antichrist with Jason Reza Giorgiani, the great Jason Giorgiani, and Uber Boyo. All right. For the we first are live. time hey, hey, hosting people. both of them, I think that there is a disturbance going on in one of your guys' audio. There we go. It is not there anymore. Anyway, be sure to like Hit that bell. The bell is extremely important. Subscribe, obviously. Sneed those super chats. We're going to be doing those at the end. And also, patreon.com slash break the rules. We had an amazing event with Dr. Trajani a couple of weeks ago in uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And I look forward to having more of these events. So if you want to be a part of this, if you want to be the VIPs that come in there and look at all the great kind of conversations that take place, all you got to do is become a patron today, patreon.com slash break the rules. Anyway, with that being said, we are going to be talking about the Antichrist today. And one of the things that I was wondering about when looking at the amazing conversation that Uber Boyo had with uh, Dr. Giorgiani recently is the nature of this Antichrist. Because on one hand, we're talking about this liberator of humanity uh, that can be congruent with... Um, uh, Prometheus. But on the other hand, one of the things that the Christians always talk about, especially in meme uh, relation today, having to do with, I hate the Antichrist, I hate the Antichrist. It's usually some uh, crazy guy being surrounded by members of the United Nations, you know, guns ablaze. And that is the representation of this force of technocracy that wants to control everybody, you know, with the mark of the beast. So that's very different to me than the bringer of liberty and this is why i want to go through this but specifically i want to start off with steph uberboyo talking about the jordan peterson angle where dr peterson is very much afraid of this antichrist figure what exactly is he afraid of we are going to go from there so uh uberboyo take it away my brother I hate to be a, a figure of dissent immediately, but I'm afraid I just don't follow Jordan that much. I haven't really followed him in about two years. I really just am not up to date with what he was saying. But I do have a, a probably better grounding perspective on this that I'll, I'll go into. So, um, And just to be clear, by the way, I, it was something that you were talking about, uh, about ION when you were discussing uh, Jordan Peterson uh, looking at ION and his fear of the Antichrist. That's mainly what I'm talking about here. So as far as anything new, I don't know, but that would be the uh, grounding here uh from okay so wait maybe i'll get into that a little bit later because it's sure. proper that's like so schizo i'd say people would be dribbling on their laptops straight away we want to ease them in before we All blow right. their faces off and um, one thing that i've been thinking about a lot since i've been uh, starting to talk to Jason and yourself and um obviously getting into the UFO uh, question and all this stuff Jack Fillet we talk about the control system. So Jack Vallée is a very interesting man, obviously very intelligent. And he'd have his thesis that we're living within this thing that constitutes a control system. And I've been thinking about that an awful lot. And um, now this is actually a fascinating notion in and of itself, because the implication here is that the most advanced system of control that these fifth, fifth dimensional entities have is based on almost like psychological control. Like it's not necessarily some type of physical force as much as we might think, but the ability to influence influence our minds. Now, going back through history, when you think about this, you realize that um, as we've evolved forward in history, we've developed more, more and more sophisticated ways of instantiating, instantiating control. And we've gotten, in some sense, less violent and more psychological. So you would look at something like a religion in the past as a tool uh, a control system for um you know controlling people's minds nietzsche has this elegant and horrific quote when you think about it where he says that the uh, great power of religion is that it betrays the slave's heart to the master because the slave um, the the one part of the slave that the master cannot get can be sacrificed to him in this type of way and nietzsche explores all sorts of religious structures for example over in india you have the caste system and don't you have the the instantiation from birth the psychological uh, beliefs that are built into the the sudras and the chandalas from birth is that you are at this status and the brahmans and the people in the higher castes are, are, are almost like entities are superior beings and this pyramid this hierarchy 
operates as a control system over that populace. The Catholic Church, in many senses, operated like that as well. You have the divine right of kings, a completely sort of irrational thing in some sense, a lot of people would argue. But nonetheless, it was there, and it was instantiated by all these priests in their robes, turning around and taking people into these churches and saying to them, kneel before Christ and understand your station in life. You were a peasant. There's no way you can have that social mobility out of that status. These are all very, very interesting uh, psychological uh, forces put on top of people. Even things like confession. You go in and these priests are like psychotherapists who you betray your inner thoughts to, and then they can sort of enforce these beliefs inside of you. It's a very cynical take on all this stuff, but this is one way that you can look at it, certainly. And so as we've got into modernity, you see this um, same problem showing up where we have, uh, we, okay, we, we, we say to ourselves that we're free, we've been liberated, we've gone through the enlightenment, we've overcome control systems, we've overcome religion and all these, or superstition is really what people give out about. But the psychological value of a control system is obviously still here. You can make this very down to earth thing and say all these hate speech laws that are coming in, for example, they're, in, they're installing them in Ireland right now. This is an example of, Techn technology having this ability for you to say anything, but then creating policies and censorship, which enforces a channel of beliefs, which is forming an, essentially a control system by controlling the way that uh, people's minds think and stuff like this. So um, I think if you wanted to talk about something like the, the Antichrist, uh, it, like it's obviously a meme that a lot of people bring up, but I think that would be one of the most interesting angles to come at it is that we could unfortunately be entering into an era where before the catholic church is a very crude tool the the hierarchy of the religious uh, hindus is a crude tool because it can't really do that great of a job because it's restricted to like temples and priests but now we have this thing plugged into everybody's face and if you are able to control this and decide what people what information people get off this the level of psychological influence you can have is insane because people go to the temple once they go to the church once a week in the past this thing is in your face 12 hours a day you know so the sort of scary thing is that entering into this new te technological era that we're in now these the, the possibility for something that is a dramatic control system is so much more intense because we've basically got this neuron coming from the the, the octopus uh, controlling us stuck inside of our brains. And that's um, a very interesting thing to, to speculate on. Are we going into a, a new Aquarian order? And it's very much in alignment with what was being said in Ion and all that. So I've said a lot. I will leave it there and you can take it from where you wish. Excellent. And it doesn't really sound much like the Antichrist as it does an upgrade to whatever was the original Christ system. But I will let uh, Dr. Johnny, uh, take it away. Any thoughts on what Steph was talking about and uh, your take? Well, Steph led in with Jacques Vallée. And, you know, I've studied Jacques Vallée's uh, work for many years um, and actually had an opportunity to meet with Jacques uh, at his home and, and have a more personal conversation with him. And, you know, one of the things that um, Vallée does when he traces the close encounter phenomenon throughout the course of history and identifies, for example, the fairy faith of the Middle Ages as one manifestation of it, angelic encounters in the Bible as another manifestation of it, right? Going all the way back into uh, the Sumerian so-called myths and recognizing the Anunnaki as perhaps the earliest uh, literary evidence we have, right, for close encounters and actually for the manipulation and control of human society by these entities. One of the things that Valet does as he uh, delivers this genealogy of close encounters is that he's very careful not to get into the details of various religious scriptures in terms of their belief system, rituals, law codes, and so forth. Okay, And I kind of probed him about this personally. And it's very clear that He's concerned with the psychological and sociological reaction to the recognition that we've been manipulated by the beings that uh, even in today's contemporary American society, most people like to imagine are angels, right? Like to imagine are beneficent emissaries of God. But once you process that, right, and, you know, once you, in other words, process Valet's thesis and understand the way in which he is correctly identifying these medieval and ancient manifestations 
as on a continuum with contemporary close encounters. And then you go and you look at the kinds of laws, rituals, and institutions that are being put in place by Yahweh in the Bible, right? And uh, you look at how Jesus literally says that not a dot of an I or a cross of a T from the law or the prophets will be, uh, will be rendered irrelevant or will pass out of existence until the apocalypse, right? And that he's come not to abolish the law, but to affirm it and confirm it. And you look at, you know, all the many times that Jesus is identified as a son of David, a son of Abraham, as an Abrahamic prophet, the way that uh, Moses and Elijah are riding around in this luminous cloud together with Jesus. We're at the transfiguration scene, right? Where his followers are on this hilltop. Um, Jesus presents Moses and Elijah as, you know, somehow having survived and being in this aerial conveyance with him. You see that uh, the entire Judeo-Christian project is uh, an early manifestation of the same type of control system that uh, we see today in the close encounter phenomenon. Right. And there are some particularly disturbing cases, which I uh, get into in some depth in my book, Closer Encounters, that have uh, real relevance to this. One of them is the case of Betty Andreas and Luca, who was a uh, housewife in, I, I believe it was 1960s America. Um, and she and one of her daughters were abducted from out of their home and uh, repeatedly on a number of occasions. And uh, Betty Andreessen said that the greys who took her from her home, they, they basically froze all of her family members. Okay, They put them on like pause and uh, they took her and her daughter away. And um, when Betty Andreessen Luca was abducted, the greys took her somewhere. She doesn't know whether it was even off, off world or whether it was someplace uh, underground or under the ocean or you know, in any case, where they took her, there were these tall Nordic looking beings, beautiful, tall, blonde people wearing white robes. And these entities told Betty, we're the angels from the Bible and we work for God. And these greys are watchers. They they note down everything everybody does. They're like a, basically like a um, an Android surveillance device. OK. And the entity said to Betty, they took her over to some kind of a mirror or door uh, from which light was emanating in the distance. And they said to her, that's the light of God. And that light sent Jesus into the world. And don't worry, he's going to be coming back soon. OK. And there are many other uh, close encounter reports where people encounter people who are in the process of being abducted encounter individuals that they subsequently find out are dead or they witness entities spiriting away the souls of dead people into the afterlife realm. So it appears when you look at the close encounter phenomenon in detail, that there's already some kind of super advanced technological control system in place. And that it has been responsible for uh, you know, crafting the edifice of these religious belief systems throughout the course of history and, and, you know, reshaping human society by means of institutionalizing these beliefs. So this problematizes the definition of the Antichrist that uh, Steph opened with. Because if the idea of the Antichrist is that, you know, he's some great deceiver who uses super advanced technology in order to manipulate people with various machinations, well, that's what God is already doing. And if, you know, look, the devil or Satan or whatever you want to call him, Lucifer, okay, is a figure with a very definite character and a, a history of literary meaning, right? I mean, this you have to you understand who Satan is, you got to look at the Bible. And if you look at the Bible from the beginning to the end, it's clear that Satan represents enlightenment and liberation from the control that God uh, very openly admits to wanting to have over humanity, right? I mean, the, in the book of Revelations, 
uh, there's this line about how Michael and his angels went to war against the dragon, quote, that serpent of old. So the dragon of the apocalypse is identified with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. What does the serpent, serpent in the Garden of Eden do? The serpent offers the fruit of knowledge to humanity and says, if you eat of this, your eyes will be opened and you'll know the difference between uh, good and evil. In other words, you'll know if evil is being done to you, right? And um, God banishes humanity from Eden from out of fear that we will go on to eat also of the tree of life and then we'll become like unto the Elohim. That's the phrase that's used in the original Hebrew, right? Let's banish them from Eden in case they should also reach out and eat of the tree of life and become like unto us, meaning like unto the Elohim, with Yahweh being the Adonai Elohim or the chief of the Elohim, like Zeus is the chief of the Olympians, right? So apparently the tree of knowledge was one facet or aspect of godlike power, and the tree of life, perhaps standing for something like genetic engineering or the capacity to transform ourselves biologically, right, to defy the limits of our mortality, this is another aspect of godlike power. And so this jealous God banishes us from Eden so that he can continue to have control over us. And, and what does he decree at the same time as we're expelled from the garden? That we're going to have a life of toil and servitude, uh, you know, constant hard labor, that, as Nietzsche himself puts it in, in uh, The Antichrist, is intended to prevent us from being able to think, right? And you see then the figure of Satan reemerge over and over again throughout the Bible in uh, the story of how the certain group of the angels rebelled against Yahweh, and they came down and they interbred with humans and brought them knowledge, particularly brought them knowledge through the women that they interbred with, and this created this antediluvian civilization in rebellion against God, which, of course, has to be wiped out in Noah's flood. After that, you have the Tower of Babel rising up again as a symbol of satanic defiance, right, of a kind of scientifically minded civilization reaching for the heavens, reaching for the stars in defiance of God. And God raises that to the ground. OK, and so you see this uh, satanic rebellion repeated throughout the course of biblical history. Well, that's not some machination that aims to enslave mankind. That's a machination to free mankind from an already existing control system where, you know, the controller himself admits very openly that we're supposed to remain ignorant, submissive, uh, you know, obedient and, uh, you know, vastly inferior to him in power and ability. So that's uh, the first rejoinder that I would have to the way that, you know, the, the image of the Antichrist was set up in Steph's opening remarks. Wow, where to go from here? While I do want to focus on the Antichrist, I do want to play angels, or rather God's advocate, and ask, would there have been any reason at that point to withhold any piece of information if, for example, people were not ready, let's say, I don't know, like, for example, the Jews, they have a lot of these festivities that have to do with alcohol, and it's very rare that you get, you know, Jews acting like sorry stuff like Irishmen when it comes to, you know, being, <laughs> I see the eyes, uh, when it comes to being very much uh, rowdy, which shows me that there has been, like, a certain amount of discipline that people have uh, gotten when it comes to how to handle your uh, alcohol that may not show up, you know, like, take, you know, half of my culture, you know, like Russians, for example, there's a lot of roundness that comes in when Russians partake. So would there be any kind of um, uh, idea here, perhaps, that God or the Elohim or whoever wanted to make sure that we don't royally screw things up when it comes to the kind of responsibility that we would have with certain knowledge? And that's just like in brief, and I want to move back onto the Antichrist. But uh, Jason and uh, Steph as well, any thoughts? Okay, so if you look at even valet again to go back to how how steph opened okay in his book the invisible college which is where valet really introduces this idea of the control system he does trace it back to uh the sumerian myths and the anunnaki okay and it's been demonstrated by mainstream biblical scholars that you know most of the myths of the of the uh of the tanakh of the jewish bible have sumerian prototypes. Okay. They were drawn largely from a lot of them from Sumerian mythology. So the oldest versions of these myths are present in Sumerian mythology. 
And one of the things that we see very clearly there, which I discuss again at length in my book, Closer Encounters, is that humanity, this version of humanity that we're part of, was engineered as a slave species by these Anunnaki. So in Genesis, when it says that the Elohim made men and women in their own image, that's the original Hebrew, which has been corrupted in our King James and other English translations, that they made us in their image, it means that they're humanoid beings who fashioned a slave race, uh, you know, more or less in their image to carry out hard labor for them and potentially also as sex slaves and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, other forms of degrading servitude. OK, so I don't buy the premise that that, that is implicit in your question because it's not a question of angels or Anunnaki or whatever you want to call them, taming uh, a, a, a savage, barbarous, pre-existing humanity. No, what the myths tell us and what is even really affirmed in, the, uh, in Genesis and the story of Eden, if you read between the lines, is that humanity was created as a slave race to begin with. And who... Satan is the adversary. All the, all the Hebrew word shaitan means is the adversary, right? Um, ha shaitan or the adversary was attempting to free humanity from the, its status as a slave race, as a subordinate class of beings. And in the Sumerian version, of course, that figure, which is symbolized by the serpent in Eden, is Enki. And Enki has this battle with, you know, Enlil, who is basically the Yahweh figure, see? And uh, so, so anyway, that would be my rejoinder to that. And I, I don't know if Steph wants Very to. Interesting. Yeah, Steph, uh, I mean, when it comes to not even what really happened back then with the Anunnaki and so forth, but more as far as how a lot of philosophers and scholars have interpreted all those things having to do with uh, the Garden of Eden and being cast out, and some inherent problem that Adam and Eve had back then, would you have any thoughts on that? Like any kind of pushback that you may perhaps give to how Jason sees it, not to say that he's wrong with that historical interpretation, but more of how the lessons that we extract from it may be slightly different as far as our growth goes. So um, there's a lot of things actually with many of the things that Jason is saying that we could go one by one into. So for example, I've heard Alex Jones talk an awful lot about this idea that the entities are giving uh, the elites technology. And so this stuff, you know, was given to the, the elites and they were told it's time to disclose the phones because this is going to allow us to instantiate our next control system. So this is, you know, regardless of if you believe this idea or not, it is a very interesting thing to allow tickle your imagination that these guardians or these entities, whatever they are, they've been here throughout our entire history and they float down when the time is right and they land on the ziggurats 4,000 years ago and they would give people like, you know, they would give people institutions of knowledge. And then maybe they came down via Yahweh and they told these, these early Christians to build this church. And the church is almost like, like now we have this control system built on technology. It's, so it's the TV, it's the mobile phones, it's this um, infrastructure of mind control premised on tech, technology's ability to, to put information inside of our heads. That's the control system we're in now. But 2,000 years ago, um, the entities or Yahweh, whoever it was, came down and said, all right, you 12 apostles, you go out and do this and create a church. And the church is like this very early version of a sort of giant nervous system that installs its neurons all across the, the Europe and then pulls everybody into this giant one way of thinking. And so is that something that we're seeing now that maybe um, the, the, this huge advancement we've seen in the last 200 years in technology, specifically the cybernetic project, because that was a big study in the, the English elite, um, has been to the rise of this sort of technological system that we're a part of now, that has kind of brought mankind together in this very interesting way. Like all of us in some sense now share a culture in a more unified way than we've ever seen throughout our history because simply of the power of media, as, as Martin McCune would say, uh, the medium McCune. is the message. Yeah. Ma 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 Martin. Ma Ma Martin, there we go. I'm turning into an Irishman. Um, 
the, he's uh, he, he talks about this. He says, you know, like these the technology has this enormous influence on even the culture itself. And this is one way you're seeing this is that all these technological tools are being put together and the control systems getting established in this way. So are these entities just very savvy? Do they understand how to influence, you know, the most subtle way possible? They understand that going in, uh, guns roaring with like laser beams, yeah. that's not really going to do much because that's going to create this very open narrative that they're the bad guys and, and we're fighting against them. Mm. So instead, they want to be as subtle as they possibly can. So they come in and they find the, the decision makers, the lawmakers, the elites, and they influence them with dreams and psychological operations. And then they persuade them to do things. And of course, what happened in Nazi Germany as well is quite famously the Virilla Society. They were getting messages about uh, technology that they're going to produce. So it seems like something was very prominent and active in the world at this point. So per perhaps if you have any thoughts on this, Jason or uh, Lev, if you want to direct this in this way. I have loads of other things to mm. say about that, but we'll, uh, well, maybe we can stick well, at one point. Well, real quick, uh, having to do with that, uh, Alex Jones also called them the fallen ones, not of this world, which I think for uh, Jason would be more of these uh, rebellious entities that would want humankind well, to succeed. If I could say something about this, I think this is a very, very interesting point, but I think it's a very separate point, but maybe we'll get to it later. Like we can put it in the stack yes. and go by them one by one. Because um, if we're going to understand these entities, if, if this is, we're going to say that they're very, very psychologically savvy. They're good at running psychological operations. They understand subtlety and nuance. We have this problem because the great, the way you do a psychological operation is you manage perception. You manage the way people see their situation. So um, we actually have this very difficult perceptive problem. This is the sort of chaos. This is like the Nietzschean perspectivism, the mind war that's going on. So if there is these forces that are influencing us in this way, you do actually see this very interesting giant rising of uh, reactions coming up against this. Most people aren't aware of it. And the people who are aware of it can come up with two different narratives that are very much um, opposed to each other, but categorizing the same phenomenon. So you have a very Christian Alex Jones calling this the Antichrist system, saying that this is Jesus and the church and, and Christianity was the, the escape from these demons. And these are fifth dimensional demons coming down to get us. And that perception makes sense to a lot of people. You know, I speak to many people who are like, oh, if the aliens show up, that's a that's a psyop, avoid them, that's demons. And then you have on the other hand, it's like, well, listen, the whole Christian operation was a part of the same entities doing this stuff as well. Like it's all the same thing, you know? It's all been sort of participating in that and the same thing. And so we have this sort of pers perspective war going on, which is a very fascinating divide and conquer situation to find yourself in. So um, I think that's an important thing to clarify. But again, we might get down in the weeds on that yeah. considering well, the before, uh, maybe more original point. Before getting down in the weeds, I do want to get an answer from you, uh, Steph, if possible, if you would have anything positive to say, maybe not about the whole Adam Eve idea of maybe they didn't deserve at that point to achieve that kind of godlike uh, greatness. At least I know from my experiences, like when it comes to learning about something, if it takes time and if it's something that you struggle with, it ends up being that much better in the end as opposed to somebody giving you the answers right there and then while you may not be mature enough to deal with those answers. So I don't know if you have anything to say about that. If not, we can uh, definitely move on. Well, again, if we're going to go with all these different perspectives in this situation, so I guess um, uh, we say Alex Jones is one. is uh, He's just an avatar for this, but it's the Christian one. We have God and Christ and the demons, the, the, the bad guys are trying to pull us away from this. And maybe Jason would be a sort of rebel down to the very core, like rebel in his bones. And he's like, it's all a fucking be wary of it all. I'm, he's super sus of everything. I would look at somebody like Carl Jung and Ion as having uh, an alternate perspective, again, actually very much aligned with Terence McKenna, who I, I think has very interesting opinions on this stuff. And this would be the sort of evolutionary notion. And this is the notion that um, we, mankind, are genuinely going through an evolutionary process. And we've been evolving over the ages consistently. And there's no way around us looking at the fact that we have gradually sort of like uh, revealed to ourselves the nature of reality and the nature of truth. And we're sort of going through this process of leveling up. And as we reach each next level in evolution, um, we are faced with greater challenges. And so what Jung sort of saw happening in Ion was mankind had just gone through this giant era of 
the the sort of Roman Superman, the the Nietzschean, you know, will to power was the dominant force. And then we got we got introduced into the next level of civilization, the next level of consciousness, strictly, you know, and that was the Piscean era, and that was the era of Christ, and this is the arrival of Christianity, which is the most subtle and psychological religion, I guess, in, in some sense you've ever seen in, in life. It's a, it's a very amazing religion in many ways, and this forces a different story upon us, a different way of thinking. We have to, we, we become moral, I guess, is what you would say, and even Nietzsche would talk about this. And so we are going through this evolutionary process where we're slowly learning to be. Um, a, a different being. Maybe we're slowly learning to be a more subtle and psychological being. We're evolving into something higher and higher and higher. And that's sort of the ion thesis. We're going through the eras and evolving and changing. And then um, that's not something you can fast track. Like you actually have to learn the lessons in order to level up and you have to go through the process in order for that to happen. And so that's very much like uh, similar to what you're saying with Adam and Eve, as far as I understand, is that they began and they were naked and innocent. They were half animal. And we all began like that in paradise, you know, half animals. And now we're evolving out of this and we're slowly transforming into something else. Now, how much the angels and the entities and all that were involved is uh, another question entirely. Yeah. But that's maybe a good, in interesting yeah. ground in there. And there's also a question there of how much pressure would be required for these kind of entities like an Adam and Eve to start evolving as opposed to all of a sudden just getting all this power and then what? So I know, Jason, I know I'm kind of pushing back on your thesis a little bit, but I think it's important to uh, kind of bring some challenge here when it does come to this question of, well, if Hank Hill or whoever acquires the knowledge of the universe, what is Hank Hill going to do with it? Like we were talking before in a previous episode, he's probably going to use this zero point energy uh, knowledge to burn the entire world down just because he's not going to be able to handle the power of this, you know, he'll be very pro pain as opposed to pro, pro pleasure. But anyway, Jason, let me know what you think. Yeah, I have a lot to say in response to that, okay? Um, first of all, it's not an entirely separate question whether entities were involved in this evolutionary process. <clears throat> My view is fundamentally in form, not different from Young's of this process, in, in the sense that I also see it as an evolutionary process. In fact, Valet as well in you know The Invisible College and in Passport to Magonia was suggesting that what the close encounter phenomenon is, is some kind of an evolutionary mechanism at work, okay? Uh, both on a biological level and on a level of the subconscious or the manipulation of the collective unconscious. So my view is also an evolutionary view of this whole phenomenon, all right? The question is, what is the end or the aim of that evolutionary process and what's guiding it, right? And the, the basic problem with how you're setting this up, Lev, is that it's not like this God is the paragon of morality and is worried about the welfare of the Adamic race that it's his creation, right? That they might get themselves into trouble with this technology they're not ready to handle and that he is a moral arbiter who knows what's best for his children so they don't play with the matches and burn themselves. We have to look at the CV of this God as evident in the rest of the Bible. And when you look at the actions of Yahweh, Throughout the course of the narrative of the Old Testament, both in the Torah and in the prophets, the, the uh, Torah and in the uh, Nevi'im, uh, you see the most horrendously unethical, sadistic figure in the history of human literature. All right. Everything from his order to Moses to basically or at least his approval of Moses's massacre of uh, thousands of people for no reason other than that they were singing or dancing around a golden calf, all the way to the Lord's direct coordination with Joshua for the military campaign to take Canaan, right, which involved horrendous acts of genocidal brutality, like the siege of Jericho and the murder of everybody there, destruction even of the livestock, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, th this God is a sadistic, genocidal warmonger who just wants to be worshipped uh, in order to satisfy his monstrously gigantic ego. Okay, so Yahweh is in no position to be a moral arbiter over the, you know, uh, proper evolutionary course of human development. All right, that's yeah. the main problem that I have with how you're setting that up. And so then we have to look at, okay, well, 
if this God is so horrendously unethical, and I mean, there's just like example after example of this. And in fact, there's examples of this that directly involve the UFO phenomenon. Like in the book of Ezekiel, there's at least 10 different descriptions of UFOs. I mean, go read it, right? Like there's at least 10 different descriptions of close encounters in there. And, uh, you know, when you read Ezekiel, you can see that the craft that was described back in, uh, in Exodus as the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that led the Israelites through the desert and all that is the same kind of technology that Ezekiel is describing in a little bit more detail. Because Ezekiel actually, you know, describes how this thing comes into the temple, over the temple grounds and how it, you know, where, where it how it moves with respect to the architecture of the temple in Jerusalem. But it's the same type of conveyance that we already see guiding Moses through the desert in Exodus. And so if you have this horrendously unethical, sadistic God attempting to create uh, a control system in the form of the ancient Israelite state, then you do have to ask yourself, well, what's the motivation, what's the ethos that's driving his adversary, namely Satan, right? And, you know, for what reason was it that a third of the host of heaven rebelled against this Yahweh character, right? I mean, maybe yeah. they realized that their boss is a sadistic genocidal maniac, and maybe they were actually trying to benefit humanity by sharing this knowledge with what had been up to then a slave race. But real quick, though, in the grand scheme of things, maybe both are needed. A lot of uh, comedians, for example, attribute themselves being so funny to having a dysfunctional family. And I'm not equating a dysfunctional family with the horrors that uh, Yahweh enacted I upon humanity. I wouldn't disagree. I wouldn't disagree. OK, so now here we want to look at it on a more profound level. Right. Yeah. Let's say and and, you know, I think Valet saw it to some extent this way as well. Let's say it's all part of some kind of an evolutionary mechanism, right? Um, and, you know, here the book of Job is really relevant. The, the relationship between Satan and God in the book of Job and the point that's made about might being right in this world in the book of Job is, is very relevant to this particular question of whether all of this, whether these apparent polarities are part of a single dialectical system, whether a dynamic tension is being set up for the sake of fostering human evolution and the expansion of consciousness, right? And what I would submit to you is that if that's the case, then the point was to set up this image of a sadistic, tyrannical God and have humanity rebel against it in the name of individual self-determination, creativity, innovation, right? To create a scarecrow, which then catalyzes a process of individuation in the human community. And in this way, as I think Nietzsche understood, you could see Christianity as an advance over paganism, right? I mean, Nietzsche, for all his, you know, utterly despising Christianity, and for his lamenting that it was still a social phenomenon, even in his time, let alone ours, Nietzsche did not believe that we could or even should go back to some pre-Christian paganism. He thought that Christianity was responsible for a mutation and profound transformation of human consciousness, a kind of refinement and increasing complexity of, you know, of our minds and of our societies. And I think that's true, except that the point is to follow through this process to where it catalyzes an individuating rebellion against the God image that we're being presented with in the Bible. So the, the ultimate aim of this evolutionary process is actually to go to the devil, to go through God to the devil, which simply means to affirm the human individual self-determination, right, and and uh, creative capacity on a personal and social level. Well, Steph, uh, do you agree with uh, Jason's view on this? That that's where we're headed. <laughs> well, there's there's many there's many things yeah. I'd love to to ask him about. Um, two, I'll try bring two up because obviously, like this is uh, we'll have the the tendency to get effervescent if we keep on going. Um, 
I want to talk about Gnosticism briefly because Jason, your view is, is very similar to the way Gnostics model their reality. And I think it's actually a very poetically beautiful way that they describe reality. Like Yahweh is the demiurge, essentially. Yahweh is the, the creator of the, like not even just the control system, but he's the creator of reality itself and it's evil. You don't go that far at all. But there is that sort of same sentiment that there's, um, like maybe, uh, this is maybe crude, but it's like a cross between pure Gnosticism and maybe Richard Dawkins or something like this. We have Yahweh that's uh, in, in bad shape and we shouldn't trust him. And there's this idea, like what do the Gnostics say is that we, we, have, a, we have a being of light, we, like Lucifer, you know, we have a, this spark of, of light within us and we are born into bondage within a matrix of lies um, structured by this entity that imprisons us. And then there's all these denizens of the, the demiurge that try to bewitch us. And if we want to find truth, Sophia, we have to actually try to break free from all of this stuff and, and uh, uh, turn over and overcome this stuff. And if we achieve that, we actually achieve a, a profound liberation. You know, we, we achieve this ability to to break free from this and decide our own destiny. It's very, it's like, in some sense, like Buddhism, it's it's like there's actually strong religious traditions to stand on this position, you know, very similar to Western, um, true Western occult magic and all that. And of course, Nietzscheanism as well. That idea that there's um these forms hold us back, these these structures hold us back and we actually have a great glorious potential that we don't fulfill because we don't pursue it, because we don't have the bravery to stand like Prometheus or Lucifer and say, fuck this. Like, I'm not going to be crushed. I'm not going to have laws put upon me and I'm going to blaze out in a different direction. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that first. And then I'll talk about Nietzsche, Nietzsche's nihilism and his perspective on, on something you're saying there as well. Well, I really appreciate the way you framed that question, because it gives me another opportunity to disabuse people of a common misconception that they have, which is that I'm a Gnostic. I most certainly am not a Gnostic. And it's important to tease out the ways in which my philosophical project fundamentally uh, departs from Gnosticism, or rather, that's not the right way to put it, is, is, um, is a lot more nuanced, more complex uh, and, and more, um, uh, I think, realistic, more pragmatic than Gnosticism. Now, one way is that I utterly reject metaphysical dualism, right? I mean, the, one of the fundamental premises of the Gnostic worldview is that our world uh, is, a fallen, um, is a fallen reality. It's actually, it's not reality. It's a fallen world crafted by the demiurge and managed by these archons. And that there's a true world, the Pleroma, beyond the confines of this prison. And we need to find some way to escape this prison planet and transcend to the Pleroma, to the you know, reality of, of light and freedom and so forth, right? Beyond this control system. Well, I reject that entirely, okay? I have a... a um, non-dualistic ontology. I believe there's only one reality. I don't think there's any transcendental realm at all. Uh, and, you know, I've made this point over and over again when I've uh, engaged with the data of parapsychology in my writings that, you know, the, the phenomena that parapsychologists study, ESP, psychokinesis, and so forth, are not indicative of any supernatural reality beyond the physical world. They're actually indicative of the limits of uh, scientific paradigms that misconstrue our world in reductively materialistic or mechanistic terms, and that there's nothing supernatural at all about ESP. I mean, it's stronger in horses and in dogs than it is in humans, okay? So that's one way in which my perspective is not a Gnostic perspective at all. Another is that Gnostics see political power as inherently evil. They believe that that you know, power inherently and necessarily corrupts, and that of course, absolute power will corrupt absolutely. Okay, so uh, together with the pacifism that you often find in Gnostic sects, you also find a quietism or refusal to get involved in politics. Uh, and my perspective is very much uh, that of Plato, which is that involvement and engagement in the political sphere is the duty of the philosopher. And if, uh, you know, serious thinkers refuse to accept that duty and take that responsibility, then you're going to wind up with the worst people in positions of political power. OK, so uh, very much to the contrary of any Gnostic, 
I actually think that Heidegger was trying to do a good thing when he got involved with the Nazis, right? I mean, it didn't end up well, and he wasn't able to, you know, to, to exercise the degree of control that he thought he'd be able to, right? Just like Plato wasn't able to in Syracuse. But I think that it was well-intentioned. And, you know, well, I, I'm not even going to put it in the hypothetical. I was going to say, if I found myself in the same position, you know, would I do the same thing? Well, in fact, I did try to do the same thing. OK, yeah. and the rest is history. Right. And I'm still suffering the consequences yeah. of it. Maybe, maybe that's why Hannah Arden still had kind of a thing for Heidegger afterwards. Right. But do I think do I think that, you know, I was under the control of archontic forces because I went into business with Richard Spencer? No, I, I, I don't think so. OK, I think I was trying to do something complex uh, with a very constructive goal in mind. So that's another way in which I depart from Gnosticism. And the last one uh, is, is very much in a Nietzschean vein, although, of course, Nietzsche also rejects this idea of the transcendental world, you know, that, that I started in with. But the last one is also very much in a Nietzschean vein in that my thinking takes place beyond good and evil. I mean, this is an aspect of Nietzsche's uh, philosophical project that very much is preserved and amplified in my own. The Gnostics see archons as beings of absolutely concentrated evil. I mean, they are, you know, Gnostics generally tend to believe in a principle of evil and that the archons um, and, of course, the Demiurge himself embody this principle of evil. Uh, and even, okay, there are some more monistic Gnostics like the Valentinians who ultimately try to reconcile all this in terms of some transcendent one, and they see the Demiurge as like falling from out of the, the unity of this one, but still they construe the archons as evil. I don't, I don't see Yahweh as evil. I don't see, I just see Yahweh as a, a deleterious influence on human development, and I don't want him in power anymore, right? And, you know, I, I also don't think that uh, uh, even these entities are irredeemable. I think it would be possible potentially to prevail upon some of these entities. I mean, after all, this is what the story of the so-called fallen angels is about, right? Some silver tongue grebel convinced a third of Yahweh's forces to turn on him, right? And we see this in the Greek myths. Remember, Prometheus actually turns his back on his fellow Titans and sides with Zeus initially to help the Olympians come to power. And then he turns again against Zeus and becomes a benefactor of humanity. So that's very, that's not Gnostic at all. That's, that's uh, appreciating nuance and psychological complexity, even in these controllers. And that's another way in which my thinking departs from Gnosticism. And it's very similar, not just to Nietzsche, but also to Buddhism. And so there's a lot of ways in which my perspective uh, aligns with uh, the Buddha Dharma, just as Nietzsche believed, you know, like in, in the book, The Antichrist, Nietzsche believed that he was to some extent, you know, uh, aligned with the teaching of Buddha as well. And that Buddhism was infinitely more complex and pragmatic than Christianity. Steph, thoughts? Yeah, there's loads there, and I think um, overall, like listening to way the way you describe this, you do sound just very Nietzschean on your your foundations, and these are actually really good distinctions to make between the Gnostic idea of the other worlds, the idea that this world itself fundamentally is evil. Yahweh is the manifestation of the God of this world, if you so wish, and Nietzscheanism, of course, is is completely polar opposite, where it's saying no, no, this world, <laughs> the demiurge, the, the realm here that we're in, is the good world, is the right world, is the real world. There is no other world. That's a delusion. And I guess it's very it's a very Buddhist attitude. It's not necessarily good or evil. It's just like ignorance and reality. And we live in reality, the imminent reality, the real world. And Yahweh is simply just a it's a, it's a, it's a schizo delusion. It's just it's just sort of made up. The Jews were trying to cope with the fact that they'd be enslaved, so they they projected out their God, and they didn't correctly adapt their God to their history, and so they had to kind of create mm. this this kind of messed up version of it. But that's a very and different from a Jason's view of Yahweh being an actual being. And this is something that later on I also want to uh, talk about with Gnostic informant, uh, where. On one hand, we do have these projections that people make in order to cope with their reality. But on the other hand, you would have actual beings that would interfere with the lives of others 
and those would be the historical beings that then end up filling some kind of an archetypical uh, role. So I don't know, like, uh, well, first, I'm curious what Steph thinks about that uh, differentiator. Like, Steph, where would you uh, personally put Yahweh and that whole thing (laughs) as far as like a real dude or a projection? Which one do you personally lean on more? I'm much too young to be able to to call this type of stuff. I don't know how, what to say about the gods, but I can tell you what Nietzsche thinks if you so wish. And I think sure. this is a very interesting yes. perspective. Um, he, and, and this actually goes into what I was going to ask Jason about and, and uh, kind of bring up a point because Nietzsche's German nihilism is like fucking brutal in its application. Like he's essentially is like a Buddhist, but he sits down and he looks at our reality. His The metaphysics of the world that we live in is very pessimistic. This world that we live in is not created by god created by Yahweh. it's all for, for made up crap this world is eternal this world is constituted of one force which is energy which he calls the will to power you could think of it as like this electric life force that shuttles through everything this force is creative it is alive it is all this but it is fundamentally unconscious it is aimless it is no purpose it is completely nihilistic completely pointless completely without aim and this force this world like just morphs around in this eternal suffering and pain this mincemeat grinder of samsara when schopenhauer and buddha comprehended this they were like fuck this i'm not playing in that that is oh my i can't believe we even live here it's horrible and nietzsche was looking at this horrible mechanical reality and sort of turning around and saying to it well we have to say to ourselves how do we direct this? How do we give it force? How do we give it, how do we give it a purpose? That's the only way that we can make sense of our situation is to realize that we live in this aimless, nihilistic mincemeat grinder of samsara and we can give it a destiny. We can give it a force. And this is really when we get into his like re-evaluation of values. This is where it becomes so interesting and sophisticated is that he's sort of saying we have this very brief opportunity where we've evolved to a point where we've become conscious of our situation and we could economize all of our forces and give this samsara some type of destiny, some type of purpose, which we consider good. We actually have that opportunity to do that. But if we screw it up, samsara will continue to roll on. Everything around us will implode and we'll go back to just a new cycle, a new up and down circle of of something like this. It's very, very cynical, very pessimistic, this notion of this the cyclical pain and suffering and to talk about something like Yahweh in the context of that I think it's really just he points it out in a very elegant and simple way in the Antichrist is that Yahweh is the is a sort of egregore of the collective will life force will the power of the Jewish people that's that's basically what he says it is and it starts off as what he would consider healthy he's he saw Yahweh as this expression of masculine healthy will to power God originally when he was saying you know go destroy Jericho go all these these things he was like yeah all awesome they were healthy they were strong they had a good god and then what happened is they got conquered and then the jews weren't able to um you know let go of yahweh and accept that they had failed this is what you usually do with your gods when they lose you 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 allow them to die which means your people die in some sense and instead they they falsified them as he says so they they kind of they started to get into this ideological escapism and so this is why yahweh started to turn into the more abstract god and gave the jewish religion its very interesting characteristics also why the romans called judaism uh, an atheist religion when they came across it first of all but um that also ties into this this notion of nietzsche's much more nihilistic perspective and i, I was wondering i guess how jason fits in with this as well because this grounding this metaphysical grounding might be a little bit reductive and might start to wipe out a lot of the notions about entities and all this stuff and i'm not sure if that's accurate to what nietzsche would have said he, he just wouldn't speculate he never really talked about stuff like that but um do you see does jason see himself at odds with that does he see that project is very similar to his own project this idea that we have this chance to break free and establish our values how does he see all that stuff and maybe lev i, I don't know if you if you want to continue into yahweh you can as yeah. well that was pretty much my question right there so jason go for it so I have a number of problems with Nietzsche's analysis and arguments in the Antichrist. You know, um, look, there are a lot of elements of my thought that do align with Nietzsche and, and in some cases were inspired by Nietzsche. But there are serious divergences between my thinking and Nietzsche as well. And, you know, also we have to be fair to his historical context. I mean, You cannot expect somebody writing in the 1880s to be able to have the breadth of knowledge and depth of understanding of someone working in the 20th or 21st centuries, right? So so like, for example, 
Uh, about 40 years after Nietzsche wrote The Antichrist, Charles Fort wrote The Book of the Damned. I believe it was 1919. Um, and it was the first of a series of books that Fort wrote, uh, Low, New Lands, Wild Talents. And beginning in The Book of the Damned, in that first one, Fort becomes the first person to recognize that uh, the close encounter phenomenon, which was already a thing in his day. Remember, we had the, the airship sightings, so-called airship sightings of 1897, where people saw these like Jules Verne uh, style, you know, sci-fi looking craft sleekly sailing through the skies above American cities. And it was reported on in tens of newspapers mm -hmm. across the country, right? Powered and by so electricity. Yes. And, and Fort was, these are not blimps, okay? They were UFOs in 1897. And uh, Fort was looking through scientific journals for all kinds of uh, anomalies, uh, all kinds of anomalous phenomena. And this was one set of, of such phenomena. And already in the Book of the Damned in 1919, Fort made the connection, which then decades later, Jacques Vallée comes back to, that, shit, this is the same stuff that was going on in the Bible. And so, okay, that was 40 years after Nietzsche. Now, I mean, you can't expect Nietzsche to have had the same insight working in the time that he was working in. Had he been writing in the 1920s, would he have made the same connection that Fort did? Perhaps he would have, okay? We don't know, all right? Uh, but one of the problems that I have with the Antichrist is this uh, historical reductionism on the part of Nietzsche, where he sees uh, Yahweh only as, as you put it, the egregore of the Israelite people, right, as a collective projection from out of the collective unconscious of the Hebrews. Look, obviously that's a real phenomenon. All societies have projections from out of their collective unconscious. This aspect of Jung's psychological analysis is absolutely on point. The question is whether there's another level of control here where there are entities that are hacking and manipulating that very organic psychological process in order to control human societies, okay? And, and in some cases, retard their development. So uh, that's one problem I have with Nietzsche's analysis in the Antichrist. Another problem that I have with it is that when he gets into... Um, addressing the actual text of the Gospels, Nietzsche tries to argue that uh, Christianity was basically corrupted by Paul and that there was one true Christian who died on the cross, namely Jesus himself, and that, you know, um, some of these remarks about, you know, the law and, and Jesus being here to affirm the Jewish law and Jesus being, uh, you know, an heir to the Jewish prophets, and especially, Nietzsche says, Jesus's remarks about the coming judgment and about how he will return and, you know, uh, all the peoples of the world will be judged by, uh, by God and by the apostles and so on and so forth, that these are later interpolations, that, you know, the Christianity that took shape in the wake of Paul basically tampered with the text of the Gospels and put these uh, words in the mouth of Jesus. Well, there's really no evidence for that. You know, I don't know on what basis Nietzsche thinks that he's making any kind of sound, as he puts it, philological argument here. Okay, when you actually look at the Gospels, the, the text of the Gospels, not only is all this stuff about the apocalypse in there and about the judgment and uh, threats of burning in hellfire if you don't follow Jesus and all that, but it's very clear when you read the text of the Gospels that a kind of cognitive dissonance is being set up, okay? Uh, where on the one hand, you have Jesus affirming all of the most draconian edicts of the Old Testament and clearly aligning himself with the Jewish prophets and the law that they brought on behalf of Yahweh and repeatedly saying that he's, he is the son of Yahweh and he's in the world on behalf of Yahweh on the one hand. And on the other hand, in like, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, you have Jesus deliver this teaching, which point for point appears to contradict fundamental tenets of the Old Testament, right? Like, for example, turning the other cheek, you know, uh, you know, never engaging in any kind of uh, retributive justice, um, any kind of vengeance. 
not only not retaliating, but even forgiving anyone for anything they might possibly do, not only forgiving a person, but refusing to even judge a person in the first place, right? Um, and by the way, while I'm on that, what kind of an, an ethos is that? And, and should that be put into effect in society, right, in its authentic form? I mean, what kind of a world w- would we be left with, right, if there were no judgment at all, that you couldn't prosecute anybody, and as Jesus himself says, you shouldn't even resist evil, right? Or if someone steals from you, you should just give him whatever else you also have left. I mean, what, what society would, would that leave us with? And this, I think, uh, is where Nietzsche is right in the Antichrist to criticize Jesus as a kind, or at least to criticize Christianity as a kind of anarchism, as a kind of destructive anarchism, a nihilistic anarchism. All right, but to go back to my point, you have on the one hand all these law affirming, Torah affirming statements unequivocally made by Jesus in you know at least several of the gospels. And then on the other hand, you have this teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, and then some somewhat Gnostic sounding remarks, particularly from the Gospel of John. And what this does is it sets up a polarity of contradictory beliefs and statements. Which, uh, which basically inculcate a state of cognitive dissonance, right? And this is a technique that's well understood by psychologists and people who particularly um, are experts in psychological operations, where when you force someone to simultaneously accept contradictory beliefs as true, you're destroying their reasoning capacity and forcing them to accept things on blind faith. In other words, to unquestioningly accept your authority. And this is used in particular in situations uh, that that we call situations of Stockholm syndrome. Okay, like situations of hostage taking or of domestic abuse where a hostage taker or an abuser tries to get the person who's captive to see them actually as their savior or liberator. Okay, so the, the captivator forces the captive into accepting him and seeing him as his liberator. And cognitive dissonance is a technique that's used in order to bring this about. And to my mind, that's what, uh, you know, we see going on in the Gospels. That's why, you know, Jesus's uh, statements, that's why his, his, uh, his, uh, you know, his um, prophetic mission was engineered in the way that it was ultimately to destroy the reasoning capacity of the society that it was subjected that, that, that was subjected to it, which was ultimately the society of the Roman Empire. And here I think Nietzsche is absolutely on point in the Antichrist, where he analyzes the degenerative effect of Christianity, particularly on the scientific and intellectual establishment of uh, you know, Rome, and, and particularly the culture of Alexandria that flourished. Um, in the Hellenistic period of the Roman Empire, where there's this just amazing passage, which I don't know if you want to take a time out for a minute, you know, we can even read it from the Antichrist, um, where he's lamenting basically the destruction of Alexandrian high culture by the Christians. And you can see in that passage very clearly, the Antichrist as the champion of science uh, and uh, as the bringer of enlightenment to mankind by comparison to the will to enforce ignorance that we see uh, being implemented through the machinery of the church. Well, uh, one way, while the passage uh, is being searched for here, one way that we could also bring this back to what's going on today, and also to touch on briefly, very briefly, uh, Jordan Peterson, as in the beginning, is that there has been this online resurgence of trad, Christianity, something that a lot of younger people are looking at, and originally Jordan Peterson was somebody to a lot of younger people as a symbol of creating order in a life that's full of disorder. I mean, you know, nobody wants to be in a dirty room. I, for one, really like when I clean my room, you know? So there is something that people are striving for here, I think, in order to get to some higher level of uh, consciousness. But at the same time, it also seems like Peterson uh, and his friends have not really been leveling the kind of criticism on Christianity as well when it comes to how restrictive it's been for uh, people's progress, as you were talking about. Where do you personally think this is going as far as the 
online idols such as Peterson that are being followed today. And I'm curious, uh, Steph, if uh, you know we were talking about a lot of uh, Peterson-related things in previous streams, where do you also fall in? In fact, let's start with Steph. Steph, where do you personally fall in whether his influence as far as how he sees Christianity is a possible um, and a positive step in the right direction as opposed to a, a negative one? Unless it's all negative, you think? <laughs> I've actually, I think I have that quote from the Antichrist up. I was just looking it up there as Jason was talking. Do you want me to read sure. it out? Sure. Let's, let's start with that. Jason, you tell me if this is correct, by the way. So it's number 47. It starts off, the thing, the thing that sets us apart is not that we are unable to find God, either in history or in nature or behind nature, but that we regard what has been honored as God, not as divine, but as pitiful, as absurd, as injurious, not as a mere error, not as a mere mistake, but as a crime against life, we deny that God is God. If anyone were to show us this Christian God, we'd be still less inclined to believe in him. In a formula, Deus qualem palus crevat de negatio. Such a religion as Christianity, which does not touch reality at a single point, which goes to pieces the moment reality asserts its right at any point, must inevitably be the deadly enemy of wisdom of this world which is to say of science, and it will give the name of good to whatever means serves to poison, calumniate, and cry down all intellectual discipline, all lucidity and strictness in matters of intellectual conscience, and all noble coolness and freedom of the mind. Faith as an imperative vetus of science, in praxis, lying at any price. St. Paul well knew that lying, that faith was necessary, Later on, the church borrowed the fact from Paul that God and Paul invented for himself a God who reduced to absurdity the wisdom of the world, that is, science, especially the two great enemies of superstition, philology and medicine, is, in truth, only an indication of Paul's resolute determination to accomplish that very thing himself, to give one's own will to the name of God. That is essentially Jewish. Paul wants to dispose of the wisdom of this world. His enemies are the good philologists and phys physicians of the Alexandrian school. On them, he makes his war. As a matter of fact, no man can be a philogen, ph philologian or a physician without being also an antichrist. That is to say, a, si a man of science sees behind the holy books. And as a physician, he sees behind the physiological denig denigration of the typical Christian. The physician says incurable, <laughs> the, philo the philologian, I can't pronounce that, says fraud. Yeah, that's an absolutely brutal take. My uh, God. Yeah. No, I think it's I, I promise, Lev, I'll let you get back to your no, question. No, no, about no, no, go for it. Yeah. In a minute, but but it gets even better. That's that is the part of Antichrist I was thinking of, but it gets even better in 48, which is the next one. So let me read on slightly. Trust me, it's it it'll be worth it. Uh okay, so this is the following passage. Has anyone ever clearly understood the celebrated story at the beginning of the Bible of God's mortal terror of science? No one, in fact, has understood it. This priest book par excellence opens as is fitting with the great inner difficulty of the priest. He faces only one great danger. Ergo, God faces only one great danger. Skipping ahead a little bit in this take he has on the Garden of Eden. Woman at bottom is a serpent. Heva, Eve. Every priest knows that. From woman comes every evil in the world. Every priest knows that too. Ergo, she is also to blame for science. It was through woman that man learned to taste of the tree of knowledge. What happened? The old God was seized by mortal terror. Man himself had been his greatest blunder. He had created a rival to himself. Science makes men godlike. It is all up with priests and gods when man becomes scientific. Moral science is the forbidden per se. It alone is forbidden. Science is the first of sins, the germ of all sins, the original sin. This is all there is of morality. Thou shall not know. The rest follows from that. God's mortal terror, however, did not hinder him from being shrewd. How is one to protect oneself against science. Wow. For a long while, this was the capital problem. Answer, out of paradise with man, happiness, leisure, foster thought, and all thoughts are bad thoughts. 
Man must not think. And so the priest invents distress, death, the mortal dangers of childbirth, all sorts of misery, old age, decrepitude, above all sickness, nothing but devices for making war on science. The troubles of man don't allow him to think. Nevertheless, how horrible. The edifice of knowledge begins to tower aloft, invading heaven, shadowing the gods. He's talking about the Tower of Babel. What is to be done? The old god invents war. He separates the peoples. He makes men destroy one another. War, among other things, a great disturber of science. Incredible knowledge, deliverance from the priests, prospers in spite of war. So the old god comes to his final resolution. Man has become scientific. There is no help for it. He must be drowned. <laughs> Referring to the flood of Noah, of course. Wow. And if he uh, does not drown, he's actually a witch and should be uh, uh, killed henceforth. Wow. No, that is a pretty uh, trivia passage. And uh, during it's a banger. The... It's... Yeah. We're, it's, it's like we're listening to hip hop from like the 1880s or something. Or like that. hip, it's well, hip hop from like the uh, archaic Greeks, as Jason was talking about earlier, about how the archaic Greek um, culture involved like all of these rhythmic uh, rap, hip hop like uh, recitations of uh, all the, their knowledge. The Iliad, the Iliad is gangster rap. Yeah, exactly. But uh, back to the Peterson thing. And look, I want to get Peterson on as a guest in the future. So this is not like a, a you know, a, a poo pooing on the guy. Because I am of two minds here when it comes to, on the one hand, a lot of these uh, things we're talking about right now, I think, were introduced to people by Peterson. But then the question is, how much influence does, let's say, BTR, Uber Boyo, Dr. Giorgiani have on the mass consciousness of people as opposed to, let's say, uh, individuals like Peterson who take that grain of curiosity that people have as far as uncovering what is behind all of these decisions that we're making, but then what exactly does it end up leading into? To. And we got a couple of comments here from Pancho Vila, who says, so easy to take shots at fundamentalists like Peterson. It's the new target, dummy. And then another one over here from our friend Chester, the Patreon Chester, by the way, patreon.com slash break the rules. Great patron Chester, uh, who says Peterson is a perfect example of a sellout or a massive cognitive dissonance. So I don't know, like the reason, again, I'm looking at him is kind of a stand in for who are going to be the new priests that are going to be leading people into a certain direction. So I don't know, uh, Steph, uh, if you have a take, go for it. If not, we can definitely move on. But yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah, there's a lot of takes here. I think there, some of them are very, very relevant to these passages. So the second passage, number 48, that Jason just read, I actually know very well. It's one of Nietzsche's most brilliant passages. And it's uh, it's one of those ones where he's just hilarious in it. You know, you're like, you're listening to him. It's like, this dude is just so sharp. You know, he's everything that the new atheists wish they were type thing. And um, the the mo the motif of this, the, the sort of idea that's going in this passage is that the gods like he's talking about the priests here in some sense he's sort of saying that the the actual it's like the wizard of oz you know you go in and you meet the big wizard of oz and you go behind the curtain and it's just this little guy who's like blowing up this big this big uh this big avatar to represent to scare people and it's very much like this the whole story when you like inspect the bible it's 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 suspiciously suitable to what a priestly type would want, which is this accusation of woman, this uh, anti-knowledge attitude. Because, of course, if you become scientific, you start asking fucking questions about these these men in robes and being like, what do you mean? I have to run around the, my house in circles or pray this or pray that in order to heal myself. Why can't I just use this antibiotic or something like this? There's all that sort of sentiment inside of it that's very, very important. And I think um, that was building up as an enormous emotional and psychological position, especially in Nietzsche's time. Like he sort of got ahead of it, but it was building up since the Enlightenment. You read Voltaire and you, you see all that, that sentiment where the priestly type who own the control system of Christianity are a scam and we shouldn't be paying attention to them. They, they are anti-knowledge. They want to keep us uh, asleep, basically. And this is not doing us any favors. They are the herdsmen of a herd that keep us away from uh, knowledge, truth, be beauty even in some extent. And Nietzsche becomes one of the rehabilitators of this perspective, and he sort of perfects it in some sense. He sees himself very much as like completing the Enlightenment project, which is to break man free from science. He talks about this an awful lot in Beyond Good and Evil, that um, the Enlightenment broke us free from many of the delusions of the previous thousand years. 
and Christianity was a big one. But the problem is, is that the Enlightenment never achieved the full blossoming, which was to actually revolutionize morality. Instead, most of the Enlightenment thinkers were Christian moralists, just without the Christianity, very much like what you see the new atheists are like, which is so interesting that he psychologically categorized these people. And Nietzsche comes and he tries to just push it the next step forward, to have the reevaluation of morality, to have like the really next step, like to actually finish the project of the European Enlightenment. There's a guy called Kalergi, who's very famous for some reasons. And he says a very interesting quote where he says the only heathen thinker, pagan thinker of the last 2000 years in Europe was Nietzsche. All the rest of them are Christians because they're, they're all the rest of them are Judaic, actually, is what he says, because they're stuck within the Judaic wealth and shown, if you want to put it this way. And um, like, that's quite strong. But, you know, like the Judeo Christian perspective, if you want to think about this or Plato's perspective, maybe. And um, what's so fascinating about Jordan, Pe I'm going to Jordan Peterson, believe me. What's so fascinating about Jordan Peterson is that our age in general, what is so fascinating about it is how um, almost shabby an awful lot of our intellectual sphere is, because in some sense, the new atheists are like the Enlightenment Voltaire showing up again as like a memetic echo, you know, a memetic echo. You know, they show up and they're like celebrating. We need more well-being and uh, Christianity won't bring us towards well-being. And then Jordan Peterson comes essentially as a reaction against that, because that's not a very strong position. And Jordan Peterson comes and he presents this sort of evolutionary psychology grounded way of understanding Christianity as Christianity is based and it's going with this more reactionary conservative perspective. And the woke movement does does them no favors either. So he, he ends up peddling off this an awful lot. But it's it's almost like it, this is not correct per se, but it's almost like he's fighting a straw man. You know, he's fighting a very weak version of what was going on. And Nietzsche blazed that whole project forward like he he was like these two guys are bickering in a dialectic the new atheist and peterson and nietzsche was like the next paradigm up like he's beyond the two of them completely and i've always loved jordan peterson and i've always liked his stuff but he's never really addressed nietzsche properly at all he dismisses him very very um i would nearly say intellectually suspiciously by saying stuff like oh young just said he's wrong you know like he says such crazy stuff as nietzsche said you can create your own values and young said that's wrong and it's like first of all nietzsche said you should reevaluate your own values and you will have the possibility of creating them if you're a certain type of person like there's there's all these weird things he does with it so he just sort of throws this out and he then he's going around he's talking about god is dead and he's talking about all these nietzschean concepts but never actually utilize isn't the man himself so i think he um i think he hasn't even reached the the big questions and for that reason i think uh, i don't i don't notice many people talking about him anymore at all like i personally have just turned away from him not out of like hate or anything like this but i just find them uninteresting like jason has much more interesting ideas than jordan peterson does and he really makes you expand your your thinking um Jordan kind of like he's he's a conservative in his true nature, and he's trying to get a slightly more based version of uh, the 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 Enlightenment now Stephen Pinkner type character. He's trying to like build up that corner, and I think there's value in that because there's a lot of like people who are sort of middle of the run. Um, straight people, you know, and th these are good people that hold fucking society together. And Jordan talks very sensibly and he gives them a, 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 a respectable position to stand and not tolerate an awful lot of crap. Because Jordan's very good at turning around and being like, here, um, you know, like, protect my freedom, protect my rights. So I like that type of stuff with him. But in terms of like intellectual sophistication, I don't think there's anything interesting coming out of him, unfortunately. He's not, he hasn't b bust any paradigms. Like there's a lot of things that um I, like this is you know very maybe arrogant for me to say but I just don't think it's uh it's really covered anything and I think we're all still in the shadow of someone like Friedrich Nietzsche and unfortunately it's going to remain that way until his ideas are wrestled with and and then um, we we're discussing the kind of hard stuff so I said an awful lot of stuff there and um, maybe I'll pass it over to Jason or yourself yeah Jason uh, any thoughts yeah I do hate him and I'll tell you why I hate Jordan Peterson uh not not because of the content of what he says but because of the way in which he led so many young people astray and is continuing to do so. He lured all these young people in with this um, silver tongue discourse about Jung and Nietzsche uh, while he was still an academic. And then I don't know what happened, you know, with this treatment he received in Russia or something. Yeah, very weird. Oh, you know, if the Orthodox Church worked on his head while he went under for a while, because the Jordan Peterson that came out the other end of that, who breaks down crying, like every time he, you know, starts to muse about Christ in his interviews, that's uh, something's gone on with that guy. OK, since the time that he was delivering universe, recorded university lectures 
And all these young people who gravitated toward him magnetically in the early phase of his career as an academic, well, at least many of them, have now been funneled into fairly orthodox Christianity as a consequence of Peterson's own apparent conversion experience. And I know uh, Steph mentioned he hadn't followed him too much in the past couple of years, but if you look at the past year or so, a year and a half or so of Peterson's interviews, I mean, you see the man has undergone some kind of conversion experience, okay? And I think it goes back to the remark that Chester made in the comments um, uh, regarding cognitive- Sorry, Jason, interrupt, but what, what do you mean by conversion experience? Like he's, he's like really adamantly Christian now? Yes, he has, when he taught, he'll make remarks, uh, again, while starting to cry, okay? He'll make remarks about how it's important to save people from hell. He just doesn't want them to go to hell, you know? And like, he, something's gone on in that guy's mind, okay? A switch has flipped somewhere. And I've seen this before, right? Um, in the Middle Ages, when we had the so-called Islamic Golden Age, which is a misnomer, uh, this flourishing of science and technology innovation in Iran during the European Dark Ages, there were totally secular free thinkers like Razi, Omar Khayyam, who were reviving the knowledge and innovation of classical antiquity, the culture of Alexandria. And then at a certain point, some of these thinkers underwent this kind of process of uh, grappling with cognitive dissonance that Peterson himself, I believe, has gone through. And you see it very clearly in someone like uh, Al-Farabi, okay? Uh, Abu Nasser uh, Farabi, who winds up trying to argue that Muhammad is some kind of platonic philosopher king. And see, what happens is when you wind up in a state of cognitive dissonance, this has been analyzed. Before you get to that point where your reasoning capacity is totally destroyed because you simply accept on faith that two completely contradictory things are both true at the same time, before you get to that point, there's two psychological uh, mechanisms that people tend to use to cope with their state of cognitive dissonance. One of them is to add a bunch of material to the, to the subject matter that is dissonant or contradictory in order to have this filler or like, you know, this, uh, yeah, this glue or filler or gel somehow put these contradictory pieces together into a larger context that harmonizes them somewhat more, right? And this is like when you bring in Plato and Aristotle and Plotinus to try to smooth out the contradictions that are in the Gospels and, and in the Bible as a whole. You bring in extra stuff, right? And in Iran, uh, they did this by bringing in ideas from Mithraism and Zoroastrianism in order to sort of make some more sense out of Islam and the Quran. And the cognitively dissonant structure that that yielded was what we call Sufism. OK, so you see Jordan Peterson doing this. He draws on Jung. He draws on, you know, his knowledge of uh, classical literature and he draws on, you know, uh, the Enlightenment and, and so on and so forth in order to amalgamate things to the Bible to make more sense out of the message, say, of the Gospels than is actually there. That's one tactic. Another tactic of dealing with cognitive dissonance is focus on the platitudes, Forget the things in the message that are most uh, diametrically and evidently contradictory, like, like, for example, Jesus on the one hand saying, I'm here to affirm absolutely everything about the law and the prophets, and on the other hand, the Sermon on the Mount, right? Forget about the extremes of those. Forget about Jesus saying, don't resist evil, which means don't resist rapists, don't resist murderers, etc. And focus on the platitudes, like do unto others as you would want others to do unto you, golden rule and all this bullshit, right? And uh, that way, okay, you de-emphasize the contradictions. Well, Peterson also does that, okay? So when you look at the way he handles the Bible, it's a combination of these two tactics for dealing with cognitive dissonance because as fucked in the head as he is, he still hasn't gotten to the third stage yet, which is simply to accept the contradiction on faith, on blind faith, right? And, and admit that he has completely destroyed his rational faculty. Uh, but that's probably coming. We can look forward to that Jordan Peterson wandering the desert at some moment in the uh, future. Unless because... unless we bring him on BTR and have a sit down, because I don't think that the people who he's talking yeah. with. like. By the way, yeah. let me, let me, let me, yeah. I want to say something very important about that, by the way. Okay. By the way, okay. 
I was content in, in terms of bringing Jordan Peterson onto BTR, right? Yeah. Believe it or not, I was, I hate to say this, but I really, I, I really hate the guy. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. I was contacted by his publicist. Uh, hit the woman who claims that she kind of made Jordan Peterson, probably in this, you know, this latest round where he has all the nice new suits and, you know, clearly he's being managed. Okay. Uh, this woman wrote me like a two, she starts off saying like, I'll keep it brief, whatever, you know, and then she writes me like a two page letter and basically reveals the Jordan Peterson formula, which she expects that I should implement in my own uh, media appearances. Right. And it starts off with her saying that every interview should be scripted. It shouldn't look like it's scripted, but all the questions need to be given to the interviewer in advance. And the interviewer is not allowed to deviate from those questions. And the responses to them should more or less be rehearsed. OK, so and then she there's this part in there where she talks about injecting emotion and, you know, uh, personal anecdotes and whatever. And so I do have to wonder to some extent, like how much of it is actually his psychosis coming through when he's crying and how much of it is staged. OK, um, and in, in any case, and then, then she ends, she ends. And this is really colorful by telling me that I should watch his series on the Bible and see where my ideas might fit in. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so oh, just be forewarned, right? Yeah. If you ever try to interview Peterson, you're probably going to get from from like some managing agent the list of questions that you're allowed to ask him, Man. right? And a heads up on what his responses are. It, uh, by the way, just as an aside, it does make me think that there may also be deeper levels to this as far as certain geopolitical things that are going on, as far as certain handlers that people may have that get them to say certain things and not others. At least I've noticed in certain high-profile interviews, certain things being said about what's going on right now with Russia and so on and so forth that kind of lead me in that direction. Like, hey, I wonder what's actually going on behind the scenes. By the way, speaking of uh, sort of like a similar kind of uh, uh, light liberal uh, situation, we are going to have a really awesome uh, dude, Peter Bogosian, on BTR next week. He's going to be speaking with Orrin McIntyre about liberalism, so that's going to be a very interesting show. Uh, just... Uh, um uh, guys check that out you're going to see a link to it after the stream is concluded be sure to set a reminder but anyway that is and he talks also like jordan about a lot of the trans things that are going on and i do want to get into the trans situation as well based on the stream that i recently had with meme analysis talking about how we're not going to have any gender anymore and so on and so forth in the future so a bit of transhumanism but before that uh steph any follow-up to what uh, jason was talking about and then we'll move on yeah, well, like, again, you know, I think I, I reveal everything when I say I have not watched him. And I think it's very good to look at me as the demographic that he first blew up with. And Jason points out that, like, we all got really caught up with what he was saying. Now, there's a fascinating aspect to this because um, people use look at Jordan Peterson as an avatar. But I very much am reminded of Jung's notion of the collective unconscious, the rising of collective energies. He would talk about Hitler, for example, as an embodiment of Wodan. And in some sense, Hitler was being used by Wodan and um, not Hitler himself being the authority, even though he may have thought that. And you saw something very similar happening in like 2015, 2016, 2017. There was this enormous explosion of a reactionary movement of a lot of people who were uh, there to break the paradigm. Now, the way an awful lot of these people categorize themselves because they're right wing would have been um, we might have you could say we have the liberal paradigm and we want to bust this and assert a kind of conservative one. But um, I think there, it goes very much beyond this. There seems to be this enormous Western collective unconscious like there has to be you know and we all across the west have a self-conception and understanding of ourselves we're all in some sense connected by a united history a united identity and um, via our dreams if you want to get very young in you know we have this collective understanding of ourselves and the last 70 years the last maybe maybe even longer but especially the last 20 and um, has been very demoralizing like you go into academic and colleges now and you will come across stories i remember going through it in college and i didn't realize what it was and it was like you male white man evil did all the terrible things colonialism you're irish but you're white and you're male so you probably did colonialism as well it's like all right this is weird feminism like it, all this stuff is a, a demoralizing historical narrative that 
wears away at your identity and makes you feel guilty about who you are. Nietzsche would talk this talk about this as the the the, the masters or the, the 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 guilt being this tonic that destroys and poisons the spiritual um, soul of people. You see this an awful lot in the English as well. Like they're they're completely ruined because of this type of thinking. And of course, that had been going on for years. And there was a lot of different people from a lot of different directions that began to stir up a reactionary force to this. And the social media just allowed this to explode into an enormous um, tidal wave. And so Trump was one expression of it. And Jordan Peterson was another. And you kind of look back at it now and you kind of say, was he so much like a lot of people say he was some type of genius. It's like, he sort of seems like he was just, he was riding a wave, you know, he yeah. kind of caught a wave very, very well. And he, he represented the idea as well. And he's a very smart man. I do appreciate him in many ways. And Jason might fucking throw a, throw a rock at me or something <laughs> like this. But, uh, but he, he obviously yeah. could like articulate it very well. Yeah. But this is, what's interesting is that the first expression of that force, that energy doesn't necessarily mean it was righteous or it was correct, or even that he was representing it properly. You know, there's a lot of different ways that energy came out. Some people had like, like this vitalist Nietzschean perspective. Some people had this sort of, I don't know, Trumpist perspective. You have the hard conservatives, you have the mm. reactionary traditionalist Christians. And I think it's important to understand that these are all attempts to take this in certain directions. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that captures the spirit correctly. Is that That's what it can mean. Nietzsche, for example, was actually making an awful lot of his commentaries about Germany, about the same vital collective forces that Hitler used in his project with Nazism. But Nietzsche probably would have completely hated Nazism. Or he might have even hated the, the, the earlier 1918 project, 1914 project. He kind of hated Bismarck as well, but he was always saying that he wanted to see these forces economized towards his ideal. He actually wanted to get Germany to focus less so on becoming a military nation and try to become a sort of cultural super force like the Greeks and transform the... the, the you could think of it like he wanted Germany to become something like what modern America is, where Hollywood would and and modern american culture propagates all around the world and has this enormous cultural effect and basically mm. has the effect of changing the value systems of everywhere well, across the weimar across germany the world. weimar germany was kind of like that in a way like with the uh, ufa for example and other uh, innovations at around that time i mean that kind of does go back to the whole transgenderism uh, conversation as well because they were doing a lot of that stuff during weimar but before getting to the transgenderism though what you were just talking about right now stuff having to do with um people being more let's say puppeted by the will of the masses as opposed to being one's own ubermensch it does make me think like when you get to like that level of power how much is that power really yours to do with as you want as opposed to you becoming more or less a victim of the whims of the people like for example trump without the people who is trump you know jordan peterson without his followers who is jordan peterson so that's another thing i'm kind of curious uh, Jason and Steph, what you guys think about that? Because if the whole idea of becoming the Ubermensch is to transcend a lot of these cycles you're stuck in, then at least the examples we're seeing today is not of independent people at all. We're seeing people that are forced to act in a certain way because, you know, saying the right thing about this within your group gets you clout and saying the wrong thing, you know, gets you uh, unsubscribed. I, uh, um, you, you want go on, yes, go on. yes. So, um, I think this is another reason why the Christian conception of the Antichrist is retarded, because basically the Christian evangelical, you know, although trad Catholics basically have the same vision uh, of the Antichrist is like a super Trump. Like there's going to be this guy who's an uber populist and he speaks a lot better than Trump uh, and he's going to unify the whole world and probably under the banner of the United Nations. Right. And. Uh, that Antichrist is a super populist figure. Well, excuse me, but okay, the vast majority of people on earth believe in some retarded hierarchical religious uh, system, right? I mean, two thirds of the planet is Abrahamic. So if you're going to unify the whole planet under a single belief system, under a single flag, you're going to have to pander to the Abrahamic religions for sure, for sure, okay? Uh, Judaism, Christianity, I mean, Judeo-Christianity and Islam. And then you're going to have to also find some way to accommodate the Hindus. Well, Satanism is not at all consistent with Hinduism. From the Hindu perspective, Satanism is Ashura worship. It's Titan worship. It's Titanism. 
right? So if you try to map Satanism onto Hinduism, the Hindus would demonize Satan or Lucifer or whatever just as much as the Muslims and the Christians yeah. would. Not okay, the Zoroastrians, though. That would be the uh, exception. Okay, but there's hardly any Zoroastrians in the world, so they're irre irrelevant in terms of pandering to the global mob. Yeah. And so, you know, this whole Christian image of the Antichrist as a world unifying figure doesn't make any sense. The only way you're going to unify the whole planet under something like the flag of the United Nations is through an interfaith perennialist discourse, which is exactly what I'm concerned about. Mm. But that okay? brings me to the Muslim question that I was asking earlier. Why would these very devout Muslims take some, you know, long, blonde-haired uh, people to be their saviors where nothing in the Quran was written as to confirm that? Right. Well, the Quran, first of all, does say it's the completion of the Abrahamic revelation and an updated version of Christianity, right? So certainly a, a Muslim who uh, embraces perennialism has Quranic grounds to accommodate Christianity because that is a Quranically legitimate position. When it comes to other religions like Hinduism, right? And uh, the possibility that these entities are going to come down and say, well, yeah, we sent Jesus into the world, but Krishna was also an avatar sent by us, right? And we're also the devas. And uh, I think what is going to accommodate that within the Islamic world will be a more mystical, more Sufi form of Islam. And that's why, actually, I've always believed that the greatest danger from within the Islamic world is not Saudi Arabia or even Pakistan. The greatest danger is from an institution like the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's really the danger that you're going to have, you know, or a country like Egypt, for example, where you could also see something like this come from out of the Egyptian heritage, where some hybrid mystical mumbo jumbo discourse is going to accommodate for an interfaith cooperation, not just with Christians, but even with Hindus, with, with Vedantists, right? And you can see this very clearly in someone like Sayyid Hossein Nasr, uh, the Iranian, um, let's say, I don't know, what do you want to call him? Religious intellectual, okay? They yeah. have this term, Roshan uh, Fikr uh, Mazhabi, religious intellectual. Certainly, I wouldn't call him a philosopher. But Sayyid Hossein Nasr, is a contemporary representative of the uh, perennialist or traditionalist school founded by Rene Gunan, who himself, of course, converted to Islam, right, toward the end of his life and saw Islam as the culmination of the tradition. So just as in his time, Gunan argued, you know, a lot of Gunan's early writing was about Hinduism. And yet Gunan came around to the view that these are all facets of the same primordial tradition and that actually Islam is the most complete form of the same tradition that in an earlier phase of human uh, society was um, uh, instantiated as Hinduism, as, as Vedanta. And Sayyid Hussein Nas has very much the same view today. So my concern is that you're going to see a reshaping of geopolitics within the Islamic world to create a kind of super state with a Sayyid Hussein Nasr type Islamic ideology as one prong of this global traditionalist system, this global perennialist system. And the Antichrist is the person who stands against that, meaning the Antichrist is not a populist. Embodying the Antichrist archetype is to stand against the majority, right? And this is very much, uh, you know, in line with Nietzsche and ne with Nietzsche's anti-democratic discourse. Be the goat um, instead of the sheep. The Ubermensch does not pander to the mob. The Ubermensch is not interested in like winning popularity on a global scale. The Ubermensch acts strategically and decisively to win, even if he's up against 99% of the world. Mm. And the model for that is piratical. The model for that might involve something like corporate power. It would involve ways of being effective and acting on a global scale that are not democratic and that don't involve going through the representative political systems of the world. I uh, don't want to dwell on this too much, but the only pushback that I could possibly give when I just think about the amount of uh, Sunni 
Muslims in the world, as opposed to the Shiites and as opposed to the mystics, that I'm not really sure that they would go for this more mystical or God, you know, Allah forbid, uh, a uh, Shiite version, since from what I understand, they are very much at each other's uh, throats, like they do not like each other. You you subject them to more pandemics like COVID. Well, you too, we got to, yeah. Engineered yeah. catastrophic earthquakes, uh, horrible tsunamis, uh, droughts, famines, mass starvation, all kinds of other engineered catastrophes, and then drop a bunch of UFOs out of the sky together with supposed <laughs> angels that step out of them, right? And then you tell me what state these Muslims are going to be in to you know, decide what form of Islam it is that they're going to be unified from under. No doubt there will be some hardcore fundamentalist Sunni dissidents. But I would wager that under those conditions, you would see significant uh, groups of people from places like Egypt, Syria, the core of the Islamic world, actually embrace this traditionalist discourse the same way that Rene Ganon did. Wow. Or that they and, had now and by the way, uh, before we get to Super Chats, for all the uh, Muslims that are still watching right now, I have this really nice incense here with uh, Hina Attar perfume in there it smells really really nice i highly recommend you guys take a look at it uh, you know if you're bringing girl over you know put some of that on it's gonna you know the whole room's gonna smell really cool anyway uh well, go back to selling magnets <laughs> don't, you know, don't pitch uh, incense at muslim viewers all right not while i'm <laughs> all right sounds good jason so uh steph any thoughts before we go to super chats well, there's a lot of them, but I'm going to call back to your, your first question. I just don't know enough about Islam to have any significant contributions there. But um, talking about, for example, Nietzsche and the Uber mentioned the relationship to the herd, because this is a very interesting thing to think about, because it, it doesn't necessarily predicate or follow from the predicate that uh, he, we aren't supposed to have a relationship with the mob, if you so wish. Um, the mob has to exist on some level. Nietzsche even talks about this where in modern Europe, you see the rise of the good European. He talks about how like with the factory life and the way that the European habits are going in Beyond Good and Evil, he discusses this. You're seeing this type of European show up that's gregarious, hardworking, that just wants his holidays and is going to be very close to the last man in the sense of like, he just does what he does and he doesn't really have a conception of destiny. Yeah, he wants and to this, grill for God's sake. And you know, what's interesting is that he does. And it's very interesting seeing somebody like even Jordan Peterson, I think is actually speaking to that character because you have the sort of, I guess you could say the, the generating last man. And then you have maybe just a bubble above that. You have this sort of a good normie guy, the guy with the cap on and he just wants the grill and he wants to have the white picket fence type thing. And there's a lot of reasons why this person needs dignity and needs to be respected. Like they're the good European in a very fundamental level. And Nietzsche then talks about how um, the, these trends that are leading to the creation of this type of entity is going to give rise to these possibilities of, a, of an ascendancy of tyrants is what he calls it. So he says that it's going to leave this pregnant space at the very, very top for a very, very unique type of ruler that has never been really seen before in history. And this is going to be somebody who has to be um, good at dealing with disguise. They're going to have to blend themselves into the background. This is not going to be like a king of old who prances around and acts like some type of... It's going to be very much like what we probably already have right now, which is like, we don't really know who's the people who owns all the assets in the world. We don't really know who's the big wigs who actually uh, have a, a most of the financial control of situations because they're very subtle. They're very quiet. They're old money in the way that they do things. They stay out of the limelight. There's almost no advantage to be known by the mob but nonetheless they are sort of ruling the mob if you so will now there might be people above that but we're not really sure and um Nietzsche was pointing out that, that that ascendancy of tyrants, whatever way you want to look at it, is a, like a sort of empty categorical space that someone's going to have to fill. And you have to sit down and think about that and say, hmm, well, what would be the types of people that we could put into those places? Like, what would be the types of rulers that could go up there? Like the, the Nazis and Hitler were attempting to assert their vision of this. Um, I think Himmler was creating something like the SS to sort of be a function to train people, to put them in this type of position that would be able to rule all of Europe. This, this sort of like upper cult sort of initiation group or something like this. Nowadays, we have very similar things. We have the networks of 
power that do the same things. And so there's this relationship between the herd and the, the, the cream of the crop, if you want to put it this way, that's very, very important. And they have to have this understanding of mutual respect. In fact, most of the stable societies throughout history have always had that in place. You look at ancient you know, Charlemagne or Christianity or whatever, or the pagan Romans before that, there was always, obviously there's tension, but there was always this, um, this, this relationship going on. Julius Caesar was a populist man of the mob. And he was in some sense a great man in, in many ways, the, the way he executed his, his projects and things like this. So I think it's important to, to understand those relationships and to really think those true because it's, uh, it's grounded in reality. It's grounded in understanding that um, like people say stuff like, oh, these forces can come out of the masses and you should resist them at all costs. It's like they are just forces. Maybe they could be economized to your advantage. Maybe there's something that's intelligent inside of them that we should be listening to. For example, the things that Jordan Peterson and Trump grabbed on are not unintelligent those that they were genuine reactions of dissatisfaction by western people that i think is actually a real spirit that needs to be acknowledged and needs to be directed in an intelligent way and actually giving it over to bunkus heads like maybe you could say jordan peterson or more or casual uh, idiots this this is really bad because you actually allow them to spend that energy and waste it. This is something Nietzsche would always talk about. Germany had this enormous potential and it was building up all this collective energy. And he was really worried that a load of fucking idiots who would be all caught up in simple, narrow minded thinking would like cultured badly by the German education system would take all this potential to basically rule the fucking galaxy and waste it. And that's exactly what he thinks happened. And what well, he would have thought happened. And by the way, this is why during our uh, talk on the Lower East Side with Jason, he mentioned somebody very important to this whole thing, Rudolf Steiner, and how Steiner was one of the first people that the Nazis ended up going after. So, and after that, we're going to talk the trans thing. But Jason, any follow-up uh, thoughts on that? A very important rejoinder to that, okay? Yeah. So first of all, uh, you're absolutely right, Steph, that uh, in the Antichrist uh, and in some of his other writings, Nietzsche definitely takes the view that uh, the mob is a permanent condition of humanity, that there always has to be a pyramidal social structure where a small uh, individuated um differentiated elite is set like a capstone on top of the broad base of a mass of relatively undifferentiated uh, cattle, okay, or herd animals. And that ideally these um, aristocrats of the spirit will know how to herd these cattle in a way that's constructive to their higher purposes, right? That is the brunt of what Nietzsche says. However, Nietzsche's known for, um, I don't want to say contradicting himself, but you know, uh, taking a variety of positions that aren't necessarily always entirely consistent, uh, which I think, you know, I mean, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds, as Emerson put it. You know, this is something actually to, to be said in favor of Nietzsche. And there are these passages in the notes that eventually were published as the will to power where Nietzsche is thinking in a, in a very um, visionary way about future advancements of technology and the potential they have, which he describes as industry, basically, industrial innovation uh, and future forms of more complex social organization. And in this passage from The Will to Power, he's envisioning the transformation of uh, this herd animal into a race of robots that serve the ubermenschen of the future. And it's a different vision than what he argues in the majority of his writings, including in the Antichrist, where, for example, in the Antichrist, I mean, and I think this is one of the most disastrous passages um, of that book toward the end of the text, he speaks favorably of the Hindu caste system and says that, you know, the laws of Manu are a magnificent work of literature compared to the Bible, right? And he basically says, look, the Hindus kind of under, they had it right about how society needs to be hierarchically and pyramidally organized. And there, I think, uh, if you look at the details of how he makes that case, Nietzsche is actually confusing the Hindu caste system with the kind of meritocratic class system that Plato argues for in Republic, okay? There's a confusion there that, that Nietzsche is guilty of. Um, and 
so so yes, there is there are times when he affirms that hierarchy as necessary and thinks that we'll never be able to get rid of uh, mass man. But then there are these tantalizing passages in the will to power where he's open to the idea that future advancements in technology will essentially replace these masses with a race of robots that serve sort of the cosmic aims of the Ubermenschen. And that's the trajectory in Nietzsche's thinking that uh, my work is a development of. And so one of the places where if, if you want to take what Steph laid out as Nietzsche's position on mass man, that would be one of the places where my work breaks from Nietzsche very much so, and where I'm frankly more satanic than Nietzsche, because uh, I don't see any reason why with singularity level technologies, we would need to continue to have masses of, you know, basically manual laborers and, you know, unreflective herds of people uh, who, who serve no other purpose than, you know, to be manipulated by the machinations of ruling classes. Those ruling classes, well, they, they, need, they don't need to be ruling classes anymore. They can simply be creative, industrious, self-directed individuals who use technology, namely robotics and cybernetics, to accomplish what was done previously by masses of, you know, um, uh, uh, slaves or whatever, you know, uh, uh, unintellectual laborers, okay, or uncreative, uh, you know, herds of people. So in, in this way, um, my uh, rejection of Christian charity, my rejection of pity for the people is even more severe, even more cruel than Nietzsche's is. And, and so I would say that in that sense, you know, uh, my thinking is, is even uh, a more concentrated representation and embodiment of the idea of the Antichrist. Wow. There's one, one thing to uh, pivot off that as well that, that is interesting in reference to Jordan Peterson, which is um, Jordan Peterson's focus. Again, he is very much a voice for the, the, the mass man. And as I said, like there's that sort of bubble of people now who really are the hard workers and they really are carry themselves with dignity and they, they just want to do a good job. The dutiful European, the dutiful Western man, like I see them all the time and they're getting screwed. They're getting overtaxed. They're getting exploited or getting humiliated. They're sending their daughter off to college or their son off to college. And they end up coming back like psyoped into thinking that they're demons or something like this. This is, it's very, very, it's very, very unrespective stuff. Do you see what's happening? And so Jordan Peterson very much speaks to them. In fact, enormous, an enormous amount of the foundations of, of how he thinks about the world is that life is hard. These people suffer. These men suffer in silence largely. And so he wants to give them dignity. He wants to give them a sort of way that he can speak to them. And that's where a lot, an awful lot of his message would come from. And I think this is why he's so mass appealing to people. And so this sort of like very simplistic Christian mor morality does really resonate with people an awful lot. You know, it does, it does bring them out and give, give them a, a way to cope with their suffering. But it does have these limits because if you start to think of a much different type of character, if you start to think of a, a, a genius, if you start to think of a, somebody who is, you know, as we all say, beyond good and evil, but somebody who's excellent, somebody who's creative, somebody who's able to break through paradigms and do things that are dangerous, Dangerous and think big and think more more energetically and an awful lot of that stuff changes because suffering to an artist can be a very valuable thing and they shouldn't follow the long beaten path that everybody else follows on they should actually kind of break away from that like a great artist who decides to lock themselves into the the corporate struggle is a disaster for the human race when stuff like this happens and so this is where you start to see this sort of Nietzschean thinking being so important and also something that I think Jason carries an awful lot of the sentiments of is the project of western civilization especially the western enlightenment is precisely a beginning to focus on that genius individual the value of leonardo da vinci the value of those characters understanding that the entire point of the civilization is actually achieved through these couple of characters these geniuses that, that can get created that's a very interesting flip on the whole story because before the herd was the point now all of a sudden we have this bending and morphing and re realigning understanding that the herd labors so that it can give birth to a michelangelo or da vinci or or even like you know other types of geniuses like mm. nietzsche himself or political geniuses or something like or, this. Uh, or like rudolf and, steiner for instance 
Steiner, all these characters. Yeah. And there's this great big, like there, there's this interesting phenomenon that I think at the, actually at the start of the 20th century and 19th century, we were very much getting a lot of them. Like there was a huge amount of geniuses showing up. And now we're we're running the risk of, of that project running aground. It's it's kind of like you see less of them nowadays. Let's put it this way. I don't know why it is, mm. but you just you're just not seeing these these geniuses bursting onto the scene and breaking paradigms as much as they used to. And uh, that might be me being too cynical and not, and not having mm. the correct perspective. But nonetheless, it, no, looking at our current situation, understanding these enormous forces rising up, and this is something interesting that Jason called out years ago. I remember um, I remember first hearing of him, and he was talking about how this reaction energy that's boiling up can get misdirected into um you know these highly return to live in a mud hood in the in the land or something like this and that's actually a squandering of what this could potentially be because what western civilization is is not the retreat into the farmhouse and the pigsty it's not a retreat back into into becoming trad you know the actual peak of western civilization is these genius characters like the project of the enlightenment is something that brings an awful lot of value in fact most of these people who call themselves trad are showing statues made by these geniuses not by farmers but by fucking crazy geniuses like this and of course as we said they can have a symbiotic relationship with the trad farmer but the genius is the point michelangelo is the point leonardo da vinci is the point and that's a very very difficult thing for people to conceptualize people don't order their brains this way and I think that's why the Nietzschean view is so valuable because it puts the excellent first. It puts that as saying, that's the goal, that's the point. And that's, if we get there, they will take us to the next level. And so that's sort of our project. And I think it's very, very important to get that clear. But then to narrow in a little bit more on, I keep bringing up Steiner this, Steiner that, but I really do think it has a lot to do with what's going on where the Nazis went after the guy. He was one of their prime uh, targets at first. So I'm curious if there could be a thread between what Steph was talking about right now with this advent of the geniuses in the uh, 19th, 20th century. Now, apparently not so many of them left and this uh, complete dismissal of Steiner by the Nazis. Can you formulate that a little bit more? Uh, sure. A little bit more? Well, we had all of these geniuses who came in in the 19th century, 20th century. One of them mm -hmm. I consider uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, being. And when we were talking during our... Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I got it now. I yeah, got it now. Yeah, I yeah, see yeah. exactly where to go with this. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I think... Yes. <laughs> all right. Here's what happened. It's the trauma of Nazism and the Second World War, okay? Um, I can tell you from having studied philosophy in academia, particularly continental philosophy, in other words, the history of philosophy, okay? In the Anglo analytic departments, they don't even teach you the history of philosophy. So I can tell you from having been in continental philosophy in academia, that they're all deeply traumatized people who are profoundly disingenuous because they're unable to deal with the phenomenon of Nazism and fascism and with the fact that the greatest philosopher of the 20th century was a card carrying member of the Nazi party, not only a member of the Nazi party, but he was tasked with restructuring the education system of Nazi Germany. OK, they can't deal with that, with the fact that Heidegger is the father of all of the other great thinkers of the 20th century. Every philosopher in Europe in the mid to late 20th century is a bastard child of Heidegger from Derrida and Foucault to Lyotard and all these, all of them are utterly inconceivable without Heidegger. And yet more and more you see that in continental philosophy departments, they try to teach around Heidegger. And there are even arguments that have been made to eliminate Heidegger altogether from the curriculum. And by the way, it's, it's getting back to Nietzsche too. Some of them are starting to make the case that even Nietzsche shouldn't be taught. Okay. So, so look, obviously, if we've had that level of cultural trauma, where the highest echelon of intellectuals, people in academic philosophy, aren't able to process Nazism and fascism at the core of the 20th century, something has disrupted our cultural development at a fundamental level, you see? And what was possible before Nazism, namely the flourishing of geniuses like Rudolf Steiner, is no longer as um, 
as easy to accomplish. I don't want to say it's no longer possible. Okay. I, obviously, I mean, I happen to think I'm a living example of the fact that it's possible. Okay. Uh, but, but look what happened to me. See, no, see, I'm the perfect example. Look what happened to me. Yeah. They destroyed my fucking career. I have no place in academia. Right. Because if you start talking about, oh, Aryans and race and the collective unconscious and shit, th this is all stuff that Steiner talked about. Exactly. You couldn't teach Steiner today in a continental philosophy department. It doesn't matter that he was the first target of the Nazis. Yeah. Steiner's got all kinds of stuff about race and Aryans and whatever in his writing. OK, you can't teach that in academia today. And the, the problem is that you see cultural constraints are being put into place or well 1984 style so that you can't even think these things and if you're not at liberty to think these things then we can't have geniuses flourish in our culture and then you right. are at the whim of the forbidden fruit that ends up attracting a lot of people who first go to peterson then go somewhere else where now they actually do get fully radicalized because there is not going to be anybody else who's going to be talking about these things and in that sense, they feel they're alone and they're kind of justified in thinking that, well, alone to an extent. I mean, you're, you're around and BTR is around to talk about a lot of these more taboo subjects and Steph is around. So it's a small, it's a small group right now, but I think that uh, what we're doing is uh, very, very important. And the last thing before we get to Super Chats is the uh, gender thing, which I just wanted to quickly touch on. There was a stream we had, an uh, astrology stream, actually, with a uh, meme analysis, interesting dude. He was talking about, and he happens to be a Christian, which I find kind of interesting because at the same time, he's very open to a lot of these occult things. But he talked about how he considers in the future, in the age of Aquarius that we're coming into, for gender to become a thing of the past and everybody's kind of like going to be like each other. But then to me, the weird thing is that even if we don't consider there to be like some oneness of the universe, we still have, like we were talking before, certain, let's say, degrees of one thing versus another thing, certain polarities. And I have always considered like the male, female, in, out, give, receive, that kind of polarity to be something that kind of, you know, gives life uh, an interesting way of going about it. And if everybody's just going to look like the same NB stereotype that we're kind of seeing today with the colored hair, it seems like something is missing. So I know Jason, Steph, and if you guys want to touch on that, and then we're getting right into Super Chats. You want to go ahead uh, first, Steph? You need to... So I was scrolling on Tinder the other day, and this girl came up, Dana Avalon. She was she reminded me of someone. I don't know what was going on there, so that was the first thing I'd say. Well, I, I, we're going to come back to that, but go ahead, yeah. Uh, I've, I've, like, loads of things I, I could talk about with this. Um, I will say that it is, like, technology, I think, is just the most important thing to understand. Again, a, a way that Nietzsche is so prescient. And I'm actually very badly read on Heidegger. And something that I actually, so I came across Jason. One of the first things I was come across him is he was talking about, like, uh, is it Heidegger does man and techniques or whatever? He was talking about technology. And it was, a it was a type of way of looking at something like technology. Nietzsche doesn't really address anything like this. And so it was a really good addition to my knowledge. And it really helped me um, model the world an awful lot better because technology is a very serious reality. And technology changes a lot of things. Like I'm big into artificial intelligence and I'm looking at it now and I'm like, bro, it, it shit's going to fucking change. And there's no way around that. Look at what this thing has done in the last 15, 20 years. It is absolutely ripped the social fabric apart. It's unbelievable the power that a little piece of technology can have. And one aspect of technology is that it simply empowers us to be more of us. And so why does this thing work? Because it, it taps into our dopaminergic systems and allows us to get addicted to the things that was designed to take us through a forest and find, you know, uh, predators and prey and apples and all this type of stuff. And it's very important to understand this. And so we have all these passions and instincts inside of us. And the more empowered we get with technology, the more we're going to be able to serve them, the more we're going to be able to do things with them. So to give you an example, the transgender thing does not happen in an echo chamber. People are very stupid about this. You go to the Zoomers, the Zoomer generation now, and find the most right wing, hardcore Christians in the, lifting in the gym because they're like listening to all the and they're like, yeah, fuck the fuck the woke people and all this. And you say to them, bro, you're pretty big. How'd you get so big? And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm on gear. I'm on steroids. They're fucking taking hormones themselves. So you go to a blue haired Zoomer girl in college and she's like, how, how come you look like more like a man? She's like, I'm taking steroids too. 
steroids are here and they're both using them just towards different aims. Now you can make an interesting sort of objective or Nietzschean statement that is one healthy and the other is not healthy. There's, there's kind of like things you can do this, but mm. nonetheless, this force, this technology gives people the power to transform themselves into what they want to do. So a right wing gym bro is able to look at this Greek ideal of all these guys on Instagram and look at himself and be like, I'm a skinny little dork dweeb. And I can go and use technology to transform myself into this image inside of my head as what I should look like. That's not too different to what a transgender person does. They might do it in a bit more of an emotional way. It might be much more extreme when they get involved in things like castration and stuff like that, which is like you have to, there has to be a, a grounding to the way people go about that because that's so permanent. But it's not like a 14-year-old taking gear is not in some sense permanent. You can end up sterile. You can end up uh, chemically castrated from taking too much gear when you're a, a gym bro. That can happen. It's not, it's, it's not impossible. So these things are sort of coming mimetically together if you think about this. And I think it's very important to understand that because it, it reveals to you something that we have to face things like this. These things are coming now. This is what's going to happen. There's going to be the opportunity now for people to do more extreme things it's going to be possible now for people to use chemicals and gear to fucking transform themselves and where is that going to go i have no idea but it's going to become a reality that in 50 years in a hundred years Steph, you're getting cut out. If you can repeat the part. He's not getting cut out on my end. I, I heard everything he was saying. Uh, I guess it's on my end then. Okay. So for the sake of the stream, Sorry. because this is where it's coming from, he'll Alex, have to repeat. there'll be drug. Did you... Oh, okay, Steph, sorry about that. When you said 50 okay, to cool. 100 um, years, uh, can you repeat from when you said 50 to 100 years for the good people here watching? No worries, no worries. So what basically I see happening is that technology is obviously going to become more advanced and the possibilities for us to modify ourselves and transform our bodies is going to become more extreme. And we're just simply going to have to deal with the brunt forward of this. Like I've been speaking with people and I've heard some people talk about, for example, uh, genetic analysis of DNA in babies who are intro, um, intro vitalized fertilization. Like that's coming around the corner. Now, what the fuck happens there? People are going to be able to pick the height of their babies, the IQ. What happens when we get into gene editing with this stuff? Like the rapid transformation of our bodies is here. Now, the annoying thing about this that a lot of conservatives grapple on is that people try to uh, dissolve the concept of gender. And I think the left wingers, I guess you could say, are not wrong in spirit. There is going to have to be a sort of reevaluation of the categories that are going on like things things are going to become possible that weren't possible before but at the same time and again th i th this is why i think nietzsche is a genius because it's forcing us to reevaluate our, our our categories our ordering perspective categories of the world we have to reevaluate our values and so if you get all these technologies and you have a nietzschean perspective which allows you to sit down and say how is what we're doing going to serve life all of a sudden you get the answer to this problem if you get a young 12 year old who is mentally depressed and some weirdo teacher comes in and tells them to cut their balls off because, oh, I hate conservatives or I hate, I hate my father, or, I hate Christianity. That's not good. But if you could get somebody in and say, listen, what would be serving your health going forward in the future? Maybe you're misinterpreting those feelings and you want to be strong and healthy as a woman, or maybe you want to be maybe a slightly more, whatever it is. Maybe you could give them something that is much more life affirming. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. Generally speaking, you see this death cult value system instantiated on people behind the possibilities that technology are going to give us. And those two things actually should be separated. The potential of technology is very morally neutral and deciding what to do with that is a something. And that's, again, also why that that sort of reactionary potential has has such a problem because it's trying to run away from technology, trying to run away from what all these possibilities are, when instead we should be embracing it and learning how to tame it and discipline it and assert our value system upon it so that it can serve life, because I'm assuming we, we believe in life and we believe in the future and we believe in creativity. Before Jason responds, one quick aside to what you were talking about right now, which is pretty fascinating, like that uh, dualism between the Jim Bros, you know, the Baptists and the uh, transgenders. So one thing, though, uh, that I was talking before about in relation to Adam and Eve, going back all the way to that, is this idea of if we are artificially putting something within ourselves 
is that necessarily a good thing as far as exercising our own willpower? For example, getting up in the morning, doing things that aren't that pleasant to you, going into the gym and being there maybe longer than you want to, even though you don't have like a lot of the steroids equipped so as to get the most out of that. And I still struggle with that question of how much let's say, external application of things when it has to do with transhumanism, when it has to do with certain supplements even, you know, let alone uh, something like steroids. How much of that is something that will make a difference as far as your own willpower? Whether without that, using your own willpower will get you something that much more substantial in the long run, not just in your one life, but assuming we reincarnate in multiple lives, as opposed to just like taking a magical pill, then yes, you have this great experience for a while, but then is that going to be offset by something worse in the future? So I don't know, that's just like my two cents. Jason, uh, curious what you think. Just just oh, really sure. brief on that. Because, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, just really so. brief on that. Um, the Greek myths are actually beautiful for this. They're, they're, they're very genius because they're sort of amoral, but they constantly have this motif of, of cosmic balance, poetic yeah. justice. So, for example, if, if you ever get hubris, Nemesis starts to form somewhere in reality and he's going to come and get you. Prometheus himself, the punishment he has for saving humanity is, of course, he has his liver torn out every single day. And so with these steroids... And um, this is precisely how they work. It's actually fascinating how these technologies, these biochemical technologies tend to work with us. You take a load of MDMA, you'll feel bliss, and then you'll have a, a come down. You take a load of steroids, you'll feel excellent. You might end up sterile for a year afterwards, or your testosterone will lower. And nobody's protecting you from that stuff. In fact, that's what should be educated, is that, like, listen, you can become Superman for a while, but there'll be consequences. And it's very hard to influence a biological system to make itself have those good benefits and then not have a very serious thing or at very least allow yourself to bounce back from that. So a sort of amoral biological morality, which is, again, what Nietzsche was pushing towards, an understanding of not these binaries of good and evil, but this ability to think dynamically about systems and a system morality, a biologically grounded morality. He was really, really heavy on that, an innovator and been able to see that. And that actually is much more adaptive for our decision making in our age, considering the problems that are coming up. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I agree with a lot of that, you know, um, I, uh, I think, frankly, it's absurd to believe that even singularity level technologies are going to lead to the elimination of the sexual differentiation of humanity. I think that this specter uh, that the um, religious conservatives like to dangle in front of people of a hive minded Borg humanity in the future that's sexless and genderless and we're all going to become like these androgynous gray aliens or something i i don't find that credible okay i think it's the same kind of uh, uh machination that in the era of the church i mean the era of descartes the church engaged in when you know the jesuit order like literally hired descartes to you know, manufacture this false mechanistic materialist scientific paradigm so that uh, the majority of people would believe science did not present them with a meaningful account of the world and they would consequently remain in the bosom of the church. I think it's that kind of a machination that's going on here at the highest level where we're being presented with this false prospect of an utterly uh, dehumanizing, inhuman, um, androgynous, hive-minded uh, future uh, in order to get people to be fearful of the potentially empowering prospect of the technological singularity. I think that's the kind of bait and switch that's going on here. And uh, taking the evolutionary perspective that you know I share with Nietzsche, I, I don't see why singularity level technologies uh, wouldn't be used to increase the complexity of human society and, uh, you know, to develop a positive post-humanism or a positive superhuman condition, uh, which is more complex than the current configuration of human society. And that would not be a future where we get rid of males and females. It might be a future where there's also a third sex which would, you know, uh, be a rather expectable outcome of singularity level technologies being combined with the primordial uh, 
archetype of androgyny that we've seen in every major human society throughout the course of history, from the image of uh, Shiva Ardhanari in India to you know the androgens that we saw in Greco-Roman culture. It, it's expectable that uh, various types of technology, such as, say, CRISPR, would seamlessly allow for embodiment, biological embodiment of some kind of a third sex that's, let's say, hermaphroditic, not asexual. But that certainly doesn't mean getting rid of the binary of male and female. In fact, that third term only has any meaning as a triangulation between the male and the female. So I think that these are sort of hysterical and deliberately constructed boogeymen that are ultimately um, uh, serving the purpose of uh, uh, corralling people into deindustrialization and accepting a, a kind of trad feudalism as our future, a future where we have to be fearful of technology in the way that, say, Ted Kaczynski was. And uh, perhaps the other alternative future would be the one where, in a way, anime becomes real, because like... All those examples you were saying in anime, you know, they have a lot of those uh, same things going on, too, in particular ones having to do with black magic as well. Anyway, before we go to Super Chats, here we have Psychotron, the new book by Jason Reza Giorgiani. I put the poster of the book right in the uh, screen over here. Jason, could you tell us before Super Chats a little bit about what Psychotron is all about? Yeah, actually, Steph brought up Dana Avalon in a kind of joking manner. And uh, I meant to come back to it and, and forgot. So Dana Avalon, of course, is the protagonist of my novel, Uberman, which was the sequel to Faustian Futurist. And what I've done is I have rewritten Faustian Futurist and Uberman as a single novel with a lot of added material. There are, I think, four new chapters, uh, three or four key chapters that are entirely new material. And then several other chapters have been extensively rewritten. And um, in particular, some of the new material deeply addresses the question of artificial intelligence. And if you want to see what my thinking about the ontology and epistemology of AI is and of, you know, what an artificial general intelligence really is, uh, then you should definitely look at Psychotron. In fact, one of the reasons why this book has been titled Psychotron has everything to do with the question of the relationship between AI and the idea of a simulacrum. Uh, so uh, that's one thing to look out for in this book, which should be released probably within the next week or two. And another thing to look out for in Psychotron is apropos of our subject today, which is that I think uh, the name of Satan appears in one or another form in at least three chapter titles in this book. Um, and in particular, at the core of Psychotron, I go into uh, the, the little known understanding of the devil as feminine. So there, there is a whole tradition of Satan, including in the form of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, actually being female. Mm, like a Lilith? And, yes, Lilith and Lilith's relationship with Samael and of how the figure of Baphomet was constructed in the Middle Ages. And there's a lot of that at the core of Psychotron. Uh, and just as a closer, you know, I'll be so bold as to say that I challenge anyone to find a more satanic book than Psychotron. I think I have succeeded probably in writing the most appallingly satanic work of literature that has ever been achieved by anyone. Well, they could use some horns. Like if you put some horns on them, then probably it's going to you know, be even more <laughs> satanic. But uh, no, I see what you mean. I look forward to reading Psychotron. And uh, Steph, what has the Juicy Boyo been cooking up for the good people? What can we expect? Uh, I was actually just going to ask something from uh, Mr. J Jason Reza Jujani. So uh, do you see, do you know Mel Gibson's um, vision of Satan in Passion of the Christ? Have you seen that? Oh, man, around when it first came out, you have to remind me. Sometimes I get it mixed up with The Last Temptation of Christ. You remember uh, the one with that the was fun. I'll see where, if I can... where they all talked in Brooklyn accents. I love that. Yeah. Uh, I'll see if I can get a picture of her because th th he uses a female actor, shaves her bald, makes her skin oh. obviously very uh, sallow. 
and she it's very interesting comes across as this sort of like androgynous uh, very the feminine bone structures you know um passion of the christ satan i'll see a picture here and i'm just wondering would you see that as as accurate at all um like it's a really unique vision of satan because obviously the famous version yeah. of satan is obviously lev am i able to share screen or maybe you'd be able to share screen let's see i'm going to put that picture right into the uh, chat so that we can see it or actually you can share screen right now so share the screen and i'm going to allow you to have the screen shared no problem and by the way while you're doing that once again everybody like this video click the bell and of course smash that subscribe button until there's nothing left of it all right we gotta bring btr ride into the heavens so that we could storm heaven itself anyway here we go at the stream here is the uh here's what uh, lady satan looks like with a couple of memes thrown in there for good measure i see yeah, what the fuck is going on? Here? Yeah, you're you're able you're able to see it there anyway. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I kind of like her, but um, I would say that probably uh, the devil as a woman would be somewhat more alluring in appearance, you know, mm. more seductive. Yeah. Right. I mean, as the master of masks and disguises, I think the devil could do a little better in being captivating as a woman. Um, so and if you want to see ideas I have in that regard, I mean, I would I would argue that Dana Avalon in Psychotron is a very um, devastating female image of the Antichrist. Mm. There's um, th there's also another question I'd like to ask. Or maybe maybe this will start with just something referencing back to um, transgenderism, because there's this motif like we. we essentially talk as progressives like we talk about this idea of all this new technology coming and there's all these new things happening and we're getting pushed forward into the future and there's going to be this new age the age of aquarius the age where we move past the you know the visions of the past or whatever the age of prometheus um but then when you look through the past there's also that perennial cyclical idea of history that you talk about jason as being maybe the traditionalist perspective and there is this phenomenon I notice when you read through history of many of many things showing up consistently. So, for example, the transgender thing people treat as this very novel phenomenon. But if you go back to Byzantium, if you go back to the the first Christian, true Christian empire, I guess you could say, they were famous, like famous for having this army of eunuchs. I actually bring that up because we were talking about the transgenderism, and most of them probably would have looked a little bit like these characters here. They were all castrated. And they're essentially the castrated, what we call the transgender now would have been a version of this back then. And these all had like enormous political power. They were used, obviously, because they had no sexual or even um, social interests. And so they were very useful court administrators. And um, yeah, it's well, just like the uh, Reddit of, mods of their day. But anyway, go on. Legit, like, you know, legit. That, that's what they were. And they, would have, they were apparently very catty. And very, uh, you know, they, they were weirdly, because they're castrated, they have nothing else to invest in. They're more psychotically in pursuit of power. Like they become something very strange yeah. as a consequence. Of in in China, too. There was a there was a tranny emperor of Rome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Helio like, Gabalus. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was, was also the cult of Sibel. Right. That's another one back in the day. Well, yeah. And, castration took place in a number of cults, yeah. including, by the way, the cult of Artemis. But. Uh, but long story short, we actually had a transgender emperor on the throne of Rome uh, in, yeah. in Heliogabalus for a few years. Uh, the more interesting story there is uh, Heliogabalus was a nephew before then, uh, whatever, transitioning, uh, was a nephew of Julia Domna. And apropos of our conversation about the Antichrist, Julia Domna, um, the wife of Septimius Severus, Caesar Septimius Severus, Empress of Rome, she actually controlled the Roman Empire from behind both her husband and then ultimately her two sons for a long time. Uh, she was the most powerful woman probably in the history of pre-modern Europe. Um, and she commissioned Philostratus to write the biography of Apollonius of Tiana because she believed, or at least she wanted to convey the impression that Jesus was a fraud. And that the a real Messiah that was born at the time Jesus was supposedly born and who preached in Judea and who uh, they attempted to crucify, who performed the same miracles as Jesus supposedly did. That real Messiah was this Pythagorean philosopher and miracle worker, Apollonius. 
And so she had Philostratus write this book on Apollonius of Tiana, and there were statues of him in various cities in Syria and Lebanon and so on and so forth. And she basically engaged in this campaign, Julia Domna did, uh, of trying to um, basically uh, nip Christianity in the bud and promote Apollonius as the true Christ and say that basically Jesus Christ was a forgery of Apollonius. So this is uh, something very interesting to look into in terms of the early history of Christianity, something which I think Nietzsche, despite being a philologist and a classicist, really misses. And then, yeah, Julia Domna was considered to have been the really deleterious influence behind this Heliogabalus, tranny emperor of Rome. And they say that uh, he, she, whatever, was a viper that had been left by Julia to strike at the Roman state after they had sidelined her. Wow. There's um, an interesting phenomenon in the Byzantine Empire as well, again, just in my mind, of uh, Justinian's wife, Theodora, who apparently had the entire court on lockdown precisely in that type of manner. She was like stealthy behind the throne. She was a prostitute as well. So she like took over the, the brothels. It's very, um, it reminds me of that Gnostic idea that uh, eventually the you know, the the sort of Gnostic heresies reached this conclusion that the only way that you can actually overcome this reality is by breaking all the rules given forth yeah. to you in the Bible. Break Yahweh the is rules. evil, therefore you must sin. Yeah, Redemption through sin. Julia was infamous for having had sex with every single man that she had been in, in any way involved with from her teenage years onward. She basically fucked her way to the throne of Rome. There you go. Yeah, and just... Um, Theodora was very much the same. So she she was like, you know, she would probably take them into a brothel and probably get some type of like leverage on them by making them have sex with a young woman or something like this. Or maybe it's not very Christian. She'd get them to do sodomy or something like this. And then she'd have them. And she did this one by one and built this huge network and basically took over the entire state. And there was all these like monks who would walk in at the time and be like, she there's there's bad there's bad vibes going on here like there's something definitely up and then you have all these eunuchs around as well and you're like what the hell wow. is going the on the return of the long house point? now was this an yeah. exception <laughs> was this an exception though to how things were going on in byzantine rome because everybody like all the trad cats or, or orthobros rather they always talk about like how amazing it was to live during byzantine rome how everybody had their shit together how it was so peaceful i know is this are they right jason or wrong well a byzantine means stuff. essentially like opaque and complicated um, mm. it kind of the idea is that it was a very 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 stylish and nuanced political organization but it was uh you know like it, it's it's memed by a lot of people as this sort of angelic thing but they basically capitulated the leftovers of the roman empire to the muslims and they had all stuff like this going on as well I don't think it's, I think it's hard to say anything was perfect. You know, I think that's an important thing to keep I in actually mind. think it was horrendous. I mean, Justinian, the same Justinian <laughs> shut down all the last academies. He literally yeah. shut down, you know, what remained of the academic establishments of the classical Roman empire. The end result of which, by the way, was that the academicians all went to Iran. They, they basically were taken in by the Sassanid royal court and that, in some way impacted the much later flourishing of science and technology in Iran as Europe plunged deeper into the dark ages. Very interesting. All right, boys. And famously, yes. the Renaissance yeah, came from when all that stuff got, got passed over then again in the, in the opposite direction, That's like thousands of years. Thousand years yeah. later, and Lev, you were saying something. Sorry. Oh yeah, we're gonna be going to the super chats, but real quick, what you said right now, how you pronounce it, Renaissance. It makes me think of Rene Gagnon and how we may have a Renaissance with the whole uh, uh, way of viewing reality with the uh, perennialism that uh, Jason, you're you've been warning us about. That's gonna be a very different Renaissance. But anyway, that being Lucifer forbid. <laughs> that, that that's a dad joke. Anyway, guys, we're gonna go into the super chat. Chats, but also, once again, uh, Steph, anything you would want to promote before the Super Chats? Anything going on? Anything uh, to look forward to? I've, I've a load of things going on now. So I think what I'm going to do on my channel soon is I'm going to try a, a bit better produced videos because I've really got a whip of AI at the moment and I really want to experiment with it. So I've been doing the talk and head thing because it's a lot of fun to talk. And the channel's been going very, very well. I had Jason on recently and it, it, a lot of people absolutely love that. Wonderful interview. And, um, yeah, so... One thing I'm going to experiment with now over the next while is bringing back in AI art. I tried as thus spoke Zarathustra, and since then I've been doing some work with it, and uh, actually people have hired me to work with them. 
and now I'm gonna I'm gonna test it. I'm gonna see how far we can push it. We'll see, we'll see what we can pull off. It might be it might be good. It might be. We'll, we'll see. Do you use stable, stable diffusion? My, you real quick. Do you use stable uh, diffusion? We, we have a few boys using a combination of things. So stable diffusion is one of the main things. So yeah, because it's got that that sort of adaptability. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then overall, in terms of uh, things that I'm doing, if people are interested in it, well, I run obviously writing classes, storytelling classes, speaking classes. These skills are immensely important. In fact, I've been thinking about this an awful lot in relation. Oh God, you've got me started. I've been thinking about this an awful lot in relationship to artificial intelligence and technology because the thing that AI and technology and this progress into the future, I guess you could say, is revealing to us is that the more we develop these autonomous powers where we can get an artificial intelligence to do something for us, where the phone can make things it's easier, the more we are forced to not be autonomous laborers, we have to realize that we now are going to be judged in the market by our capacity to be creative to be thinking to, to use our higher cognitive faculties our ability to cr construct systems which is what an entrepreneur does or a business owner does our ability to make good decisions again what a business owner does our ability to come up with creative ideas what an artist and a storyteller does this is the stuff that's going to define us and so i'm i've like have th these education programs but i'm starting to realize that they're so they're so important to get this stuff locked down when i was young and i dropped out of college i went and i found poets and writers and salesmen and public speakers and comedians and anything anything at all that could teach me the arts of speaking singers i remember going to and i didn't realize till now how valuable it is to develop those skills because these are the things that are going to count so much now it's like, like big ideas now have the possibility i can come up with a story now and get a, a, a little film out give that two years and how close will that be to be competitive to real big films you know that's going to be a very interesting question so um i'm doing stuff like that teaching people storytelling and teaching them how to get forward with ai and the coaching very are you still doing the say. coaching and so i do the coaching with certain people so i like take on applications now i'm a bit more busy than i used to be and if people like you know i just kind of just chat them on an individual basis see what we're doing in that front so most of it would be like teaching these skills in a in a professional setting so and the, uh, that's what i'm up to and the link is in the description once again if you guys want to uh, follow steph on uh, x and uh, look at his coaching and all of that one of the most inspirational people uh right with uh, uh, dr Giorgiani, who i've had the pleasure of knowing on the interwebs well with uh dr Giorgiani now in the real life as well with that event speaking of that event by the way there's going to be more events i'm going to be doing and if you guys want to be the vips and jason you got to meet some of the vips back during <laughs> uh, that event they are the 20 dollar btr patrons so if you become a 20 dollar btr patron you are going to get vip access to a lot of these upcoming great mind bending uh mold breaking to use the reference from a guest we're going to have uh, next week uh events and uh, that's patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. And lastly, get damn it, subscribe to my Substack already. It's uh, levpo.substack.com or as a shorthand, levslens.com. I'm writing now, I'm writing these Substacks. I guarantee it's a great read. And it's also one of those things that does not fit into any particular bandwagon. Anyway, guys, that is the link. Let us all go into the super chats now. What do we got? Yes. Left. Pick a few questions for uh, Steph. I'll be right back. Okay? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Here we go. Let's see. We have two hours. Wow, it's been two hours already. Time flies. AFD, Zar, 35 Zar. I'm going to look up what Zar is. Do you believe in what Parmides called the one? If so, is being separate from the one true liberation. To me, that's the Luciferian concept. So I'm going to repeat this when Jason comes back. But Steph, what do you think? So uh, I actually love to have Jason here for this because um, it's such a such an interesting conception. So this is obviously a discussion of metaphysics. And what is metaphysics? A discussion about what is the shape of the world? What is the nature of the world? This is a big bickering going on with Parmidia, Parmidia's I can never pronounce these motherfuckers' names, and Heraclitus and all these characters. Um, so just to catch people up on Greek philosophy, the Greeks were very, very innovative in the sense that they all began to sit down and realize that the world that we see around us has to have some type of like fundamental force. There has to be some type of fundamental uh, substance that structures everything together. So they were really thinking in the most profoundly abstract way possible it seems a little bit obvious to us now but it, it is in no way obvious at all 
to suggest that this world that we see is not as it actually is. There's actually something more fundamental to it. Now, we have realized in modernity that the world itself is actually a, a more fundamental force. So if you look at Einstein's theory of relativity, this thing here, this piece of matter, is not actually any different than the light shining off this light or wind or anything like this. It's all energy. Energy is the fundamental force force but this is moving so slowly that it appears to me as a solid object it doesn't appear to me as the energy that it actually is but if i sprinkle uranium on this this thing and uh, you know detonate it this thing will release its energy through fission and all that energy will be released out of it and that's the the kind of theory of the bomb you know that that notion and so what you see actually is a metaphysical principle turning into real power in the real world a very interesting idea the most powerful weapon in the world is is based on a metaphysical insight. That's a fascinating thing to, to, to look at, a physical insight, obviously. But it, it reveals to us this idea that there's a fundamental force called energy. Nietzsche talked about the will to power, fundamental force called energy. And back then, the Greeks were all trying to figure out things like logos. This is what they sort of said. What was the logos? What was the one big idea? And so Heraclitus had the idea that it was this flux. Heraclitus looked at all the elements, and he saw that ice turns to water, turns to air. And he's, he thought then that the thing that transforms them all, which is fire, is the fundamental force. And he was sort of close, but maybe not quite there, because maybe you could say that all of these are energy in different forms. And it's not fire. Fire is just this sort of like transition force or something like this. And um, Parmenides' idea then was, I guess you could say, related to this as well, which is that uh, like all, all of the, the, the substance in the world is gathered together in this one giant object, this one giant block. And it's it's related to like time because you bring it into this as well. D there's the question there. So it's like when you, when you look at the entire metaphysical construct as it is and we understand ourselves, are we trapped in some type of samsara where we have no control over our destiny? Are we all just these forces of energy that are put in these train tracks that are going in whatever these directions are and all this stuff and we're sort of trapped in, in this sort of me metaphysical prison? This is um, this is what they were trying to derive then from their logical conclusions out of this stuff. Now, do I believe this? Do I understand this? Do I does this make sense to me? I'm really not too sure. I think you see an awful lot of um, metaphysical determinism in people looking at like um, in the 20th century. You see an awful lot of that stuff. But again, I'm not very very educated in these things at all, so I'm afraid I really can't give a good answer or a good uh, take on this question. Well, that but, was uh, that was phenomenal is. though. Uh, your okay, your beautiful. take there. And uh, Jason, the question was from AFD 35 Czar, which is, by the way, South African, reminds me of a friend of the show, uh, Conscious Caracal, part of Afroform. Uh, but anyway, uh, 35 Czar, uh, do you believe in what Parmenides called the one? If so, being separate from the one is true liberation. To me, that's the Luciferian concept. What the fuck is this guy talking? Uh, look, the, Parmenides' this whole point was you can't be separate from the one, okay? Parmenides is the first position of ontological monism in history, okay? And basically, he was saying that space and time are an illusion. It's the same position as you find in Advaita Vedanta. That sure. space and time are illusion. The phenomenal world is Maya. And if you subscribe to that kind of ontology, well then you cannot be separate from the one. Your individuality is an illusion, right? Jason, sorry to interrupt, but is that the same then as Einstein's relative physics, that like space-time as a sort of continual force? Is, is it along those lines? Because that's what I was thinking. I'm not sure if I'm correct. Here's the interesting thing. Well, that, you see, your question is a more interesting one. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated one, though, because you could argue... Okay, very long story short, you could argue that the reason why Einstein rejected quantum uh, mechanics, you know, God does not play dice with the universe, is because on the highest level, Einstein was accepting some kind of monistic logical superstructure of the cosmos. And he thought that that kind of uh, logical determinism, which construes space-time as an absolutely unified matrix, what we, what we would call block time today in physics, that that is not consistent with the kind of uh, apparently random 
probability distributions that you see in quantum physics. And it's not consistent with the idea of superposition and so forth. So it's possible that on some level, Einstein had a kind of latent Parmenidean idealism, at least in the back of his mind. That's it's possible. But to go to the, the person asking, yeah, go ahead. Step. Well, I was just going to ask a follow-up question to this as well. Apology, I'm sort of like stealing the super chats thunder here. <laughs> but um, is if you say Parmidian idealism, is this sort of the notion, uh, basically, that th there's a plan, that God is a plan, that we live within a confined, uh, predetermined plan, only that it happens in a fourth dimension that we can't see? The universe is this block that we're all participating in. We're all on these sort of railway tracks. And uh, space-time is leading us towards a sort of end goal of some sort. So, okay. The and short then answer, quantum physics it brings us into free will. Right. The short answer is no. That would more be like Empedocles if you want to look at pre-Socratics. But uh, the reason why the short answer is no is because in Parmenides' view, we are God. It's not that there's a God who's an entity who has a plan. To have a plan, to have agency, uh, and to have a machination – uh, you know, for the, the course of how the course of history ought to unfold, you have to be a distinct entity. You might be a, an omnipotent entity, right? Uh, but you have to be a distinct entity. And Parmenides' point is that there's an absolute unity of being. So any such God that you're describing would still only be part of the overarching one that Parmenides is conceiving of, the same way as in Advaita Vedanta, Shiva or or Vishnu or Brahma Indra oh, Indra. are yeah. part of Brahman. They're yeah. all just facets of Brahman. And the phenomenal world in which Shiva and Vishnu operate is actually Maya. And so ultimately, on the highest level, even Vishnu and Shiva are Maya. They're, the gods are the devas are also Maya. Mm. They're also illusion. Which is also, by the way, as a quick aside, I'm reading a really fascinating book right now called Agora on the Left, uh, the Left Path of God. And allegedly, it's all of these uh, pieces of information from these Agora yogi that was passed down to his disciple. And he talked about how, really, it's not the gods who are in charge, but it's the rishis. And I've always found that to be very fascinating, almost reminiscent of some kind of a uh, simulation theory, if you will. Like, why yeah. the hell would you have, like, these, you know, dudes who were, like, meditating and were these rishis? Why would they be in charge of the entire universe? What's going on there? What about Shiva? What about Mahakala? Any, any quick take on that, Jason? Well, it, it's interesting, but I don't want the other part of this guy's question oh, to get sure. lost. Oh, sure. Okay. Because actually... Actually, you know, I, I taught in academia for a while, and and uh, it's an art to reconstruct lo attempted logic in a question where. Well, well where okay, then we'll save the Rishi question for another stream. Let's go then to the uh, separate from the one uh, true liberation. Right. So yeah. I think what this guy is really trying to get at with his question is what's the relationship between the Luciferian or Promethean standpoint and this kind of Parmenidian idealism, and you know, if if he's implying that to adopt the Luciferian standpoint is at odds with this monism that Parmenides was the first promulgator of, then that's absolutely right. I mean, intrinsic to the satanic standpoint is the rejection of this kind of monism. In fact, I would argue that the, the devil in the most fundamental form, Diabolos, is the basic dissonance in the nature of things, which is what Heraclitus was writing about. I mean, if you want to see the first satanic uh, ontotheology in history, read the fragments of Heraclitus, right? I mean, Heracl you know, uh, the wise is one alone, willing and unwilling to be called by the name of Zeus. The true God of Heraclitus is the devil. And what he's talking about, what Heraclitus is conceiving of well before Christianity is uh, opposition, dissonance, strife as fundamental to the nature of the cosmos, because that kind of dynamic tension is the generative and creative force, all right, at, at work in the world. And I would say that that's uh, the metaphysical essence of the devil. And before we get to the other super chats here, there is a very interesting thing about AFD, which I'm not going to reveal right now, but you shall find out soon enough from his uh, follow-up super chat. But anyway, Uwu, friend of the show, Uwu, $20. Hello, everyone. Donnie Darkened on X postulates that uh, Trump is the Antichrist. Thoughts? All the best. 
I've actually seen that. Yeah. And that was something that you were talking about earlier. Uh, I think we brought up Trump in that type of conceptionist. Trump has been some type of popul populist uh, savior of the world. And yeah, he, he puts all this idea. This is a very interesting one because the you have all these um, reactionary Christians and in in some sense, in quite good instincts, they're, as I said earlier, reacting to all this negative propaganda that's been put on top of them. And so they default back to a positive identity. So what is the positive identity for a Western man? I'm Christian. I'm Western. I'm white. I believe in myself. I believe in masculinity. I believe in all these. I don't believe in any of this transgender woke stuff, this woke crap and all this. And so they go back into this sort of position. And some of them take Christianity very seriously. And then obviously the prophecy is this idea that we're running into the end times. They see the end times coming and they're, the warning in Christianity is the Antichrist is going to rise. And uh, they, they all, like a lot of them now, are starting to look at Trump as that type of figure. Trump is the false dialectic. A lot of them, this is obviously involved with Israel because Israel is, uh, I don't actually know any of this stuff, but I hear them all talking about it. And Israel, something happens in Israel to fulfill the prophecy. I believe Israel finally gets codified as the as like a real place or something mm, and, like the, and the red cap, Trump there has to be, Jerusalem or something there has like to be a red heifer. Again, I just don't know any, anything about that stuff. But, yeah, I can hear you. There, there's got to be a red heifer. Something like that. That's boring. Something like that. If I just could add two cents to sure. that, literally is only worth two cents. Uh, you know, Trump is not anywhere near eloquent enough uh, or sophisticated enough even to fulfill the retarded evangelical expectation of the kind of figure that the Antichrist ought to be. OK, not even close, not even. Close. And so, so to add on top of that as well, uh, just to kind of get their full position, which is very interesting that they think that the Israel lobby, basically, who they are working with Trump are actually trying to use Trump to try force. So this is interesting. It's like sort of this attempt at doing magic mm. where they're trying to use for Trump to force that process of history forward and make that happen. And in their view, that would be a very beneficial thing for them because that leads to the, the Messiah returning. Uh, but then obviously for the Christians, they see this as a very dangerous thing because it leads to the end times. And that's, that's horrible, and that's something you shouldn't participate in. You should watch out for the Antichrist. And so that's the sort of dialectic you see being set up. You see these guys sort of through this willful prophetic magic are trying to make it happen. They're like, Trump's the guy. They're going to take him and force it through, and they're going to support him and make it happen. And then the Christians are all like, be wary of it. Trump's going to be celebrated as this charismatic thing, and then uh, it's all going to be bunkus, and he's going he's gonna to create the Antichrist system or something. Like by, that. So, by the way, it is what it is. By the way, you know, and this really shouldn't be said as an aside in the way that I'm saying it. I've talked about it you know at length uh, in other in other conversations and i've written about it in closer encounters there are significant people at high levels in our government particularly in the intelligence community and and uh certain branches of the military who take this end time stuff very seriously and in particular there's an organization uh informally referred to as the collins elite which is, uh, you know, which, which is composed of members of the CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, various uh, intelligence apparatuses of different branches of the military, who believe that, you know, basically what we were arguing, you know, what I what I was uh, laying out before, uh, that, you know, the Bible is best understood as a history of close encounters, and that to engage in full disclosure regarding the UFO phenomenon would be to usher in the apocalypse. And this is their ultimate reason for not disclosing everything that they know about the UFO phenomenon. And I mean, if you want a, a book that talks about this, um, which I cite it in Closer Encounters, but there's this book, Final Events by Nick Redfern, which focuses on the Collins elite in particular. Uh, but I also have heard from people inside that this is true, people who who know for a fact that in the CIA in particular, there's a faction that believes this very strongly. And it's their bottom line for why there can't be full disclosure, because th they see it as their responsibility to hold off for as long as possible the advent of the Antichrist and the second coming of Christ. Do you know what's very interesting is that the word apocalypse means revelation and disclosure. Like that's literally uh, yeah, the definition. about that all the time. So uh, next super chat over mm. here, free thinker, uh, 11 uh, euros. Uh, sorry, sorry, Lev, to cut in, if I could. Go for but, it. But um, Jason, would this, like, do you see these factions as 
um is it zionist so like would it just be pure zionist for like looking towards israel as the promised land or is it christian zionist so the sort of like anglo christian zionist backbone of america or is it like I, i'm not sure if there is another faction of christianity that'd be involved with that like maybe a, a more scared version because imagine the christian zionists want that to happen and the israel zionists want that to happen but then you'd have um, maybe like other Christians that would be like, no, we don't want that to happen. We want to stop that. Is it, is, what, what do you see as the demographics as best more, as you can see? More or less Christian Zionists, but they're much more sophisticated and um, I don't know, considerate than your average Christian Zionist from the Bible Belt. They, they, how they've justified this to themselves is that we need to give people more time. We need to buy. Look, humanity, humanity is in a sorry state, and we need to compassionately buy as much time as possible for people to turn their hearts toward Christ so that when the apocalypse happens, as many people as possible can be saved. That's the way they justify this to themselves, these Collins elite people. And yeah, they're Christian Zionists. No Zionist would ever support this view. Okay, if you actually go and look at uh, you know, the foundations of Zionism, I mean, you know, Israeli Zionism, and the Zionists were followers of Nietzsche. Uh, Zionism, the two major influences on Zionism were Nietzsche and Marx, and the original conception of the state of Israel was radically secular and somewhat socialistic. It was not ultimately conceived of as a Jewish state in a religious sense at all. So, so the Zionists actually look at these Christian Zionists like they're crazy. I mean, they manipulate them because they want you know, funding for Israel, uh, but privately they they think that they're insane. Yeah, Israel is not really a religious uh, state like uh, the kind people think of. No, but, and they, ha they yeah. re have real contempt for these American Christian Zionists. I know mm -hmm. that for a fact. So uh, we have over here, free thinker, 11 euros. Is there a link between AI and the concept of the Antichrist? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, in these uh, right wing, well, right wing, in these uh, populist conspiracy theories, the the Antichrist is going to take control of the world, probably through the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, and insofar as the Antichrist is a representative of Satan, perhaps they conceive of Satan as that artificial intelligence, right? But this is consistent with the entire history of conceptions of Satan and of the Antichrist being repeatedly rescaled to the level of technology that we have. But going back to the Middle Ages, it was alchemy that, yeah. you know, Satan is the master alchemist. Right. And then later on in the Age of Enlightenment, Satan was like the patron of, you know, uh, materialistic science. And he was probably behind the Royal Academy in Britain mm -hmm. and whatever. And now and today it's artificial intelligence. Well, Satan is the it's, AI. It's, like, it's like our human bodies were looked at as being, you know, like particular devices from a particular time. You know, like our bodies are like mechanical or our bodies are like, you know, biological, whatever. Uh, but yeah, there is a, re a related question coming up from uh, AFD, which I really could, want to Could get I to. actually go for it, brother? That. Go for it. Because I, I think the two of you bring up a very fascinating and fantastic point. And it's also something for us to consider generally, where we have these pillars built into our perspective that actually get in the way of us thinking clearly. Again, coming back to sort of the Western Enlightenment perspective, where they would always spit at superstitio, superstition, as being just a frustration towards doing true pursuit of knowledge, which is what science is. And we have this issue then with this sort of antichrist conceptualization so much, because it forces us to constantly look at anything new or weird and project upon it old um imagistic forms like we're dreaming and asserting dreams upon reality and this is very much like a Jungian in the way that he would talk about us doing this and lev points out like this very fascinating question that like and and jason as well that you just go back in time and we were projecting a, a different story on that current era and it's just not the reality at all like if you look at our situation and um, new technologies show up all the time and they have this profound effect all the time because that's what technologies do when the gun came it had this huge equalizing effect that brought down the old knights in shining armor. You know, like that's like, what, what was that? That was a weird phenomenon. Uh, cannons, what was going on? Gunpowder, what was going on there? Now we have computers. And what actually happens is I think it's much more 
Greek in the way it happens. I was talking about the Greek myths have this profound sort of Heraclitian schizophrenic balancing force. Everything is in strife and there's this sort of morphing opposites going on. And what you see is this, these huge technologies rise up and they don't generate, they generate a dialectic nearly. So to give you an example of this, and the big scary thing that a lot of us look out at is the all powerful control of the system or the, the elite or whatever you want to call it. And we could say the financial systems and the bankers, that's one that we, we always talk about. And that's a very very real force. There's this giant organized financial system that has so much power because it's got a technological cybernetic system that it can plug you into and take you off if it wants to get rid of your bank account. And what's interesting is that during our era where technology gives the potential for something like that happens, the same time this sort of like nemesis force appears, which is cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, a, a profound, like the, something you've never before seen in history pops up. This, this idea of a decentralized monetary currency that acts as the countervailing force that all of a sudden throws off the possibility of that system becoming a total control force. It can't do it because as long as crypto currency exists, they'd have to literally delete laptops in order for that to get real. And that's just like how, how subverted that has become because of this opposite force. And so with artificial intelligence, it, with all technology, it's the same thing. The internet is an incredible tool for mind control and propaganda and propagating. People look at this thing 12 hours a day but at the same time it's the best tool for subverting and chewing away and caustically wearing away at narratives and propaganda it's bringing down the entire self-conception of the western the western world of the last 80 years or so and artificial intelligence is going to be the exact same thing it's going to be mind-blowing it's going to be bizarre it's going to lead to p potentials for terrible things and terrible possibilities but if we're energetic about it and we actually work with it and people people with good strong values assert themselves upon this thing and utilize this thing it will equally show opportunities that will be incredibly useful and allow us to do incredible things that will lead to uh, more freedom more creativity and more potential and that's just the sort of fundamental reality this hubris and nemesis dynamic always seems to show up with this stuff and we project binary good and evil onto it antichrist whatever it is it just stops us thinking about the tools and then we just we just we see a story and not reality and that really gets in the way excellent excellent so now we have a uh, chester the great chester patron of patreon.com slash break the rules ten dollars thank you left for having uber boyo and professor jajani engaging in this conversation oh thank you chester for watching we uh, we love chester and now we have the one I've been waiting for, another one from AFD from South Africa, 35 Zar, who apparently is of the Nation of Islam, where he says over here, Elijah Muhammad essentially told us this false god, Yaqub, is associated with an AI in the moon that has been running planet for 6,000 years. Any thoughts? Yeah, this is a, one of the most fascinating things, you know, uh, Elijah Muhammad was a contactee, you know, Elijah Muhammad was an abductee. They, they, uh, UFOs, uh, picked him up and they gave him this whole message to go found the nation of Islam. And <clears throat> that shows you that this phenomenon that begins in the Bible, well, actually, I mean, like we were saying earlier, you can see it all the way back in Sumerian texts, but this phenomenon that's evident in, uh, the prophetic missions of Moses and, you know, where Ezekiel is interacting with all these UFOs, it continues to this day. To this day, you have these uh, UFO knots coming down and creating cults uh, with all kinds of uh, nefarious agendas um, and, and terribly deleterious uh, social consequences, which, of course, I would consider the nation of Islam among, chief among. Well, yeah, among well Yaqub, from what I understand in the uh, nation of Islam mythology, is supposed to be this rebellious uh, scientist, black uh, alien scientist who creates white people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's right aligned with the Wakanda narrative, you know, and like uh, it's unbelievable that they're still trying these things today. And another example, if you want to go a little further back in time, is Joseph Smith. If you really look into the origins of the Mormon faith, Joseph Smith is another close encounter uh, case. Um, and then you have this cult in Canada, that guy Rael, you know, the Raelians up there in, mm -hmm. in Quebec in particular. Nation of Islam fits into that pattern of uh, basically modern uh, UFO cults, uh, new religions founded by these same um, gods, angels, who interacted with Moses and who sent Jesus into the world. 
and uh, Scientology as well. There was, by the way, a recent. Uh, Who was a charlatan? I don't. I don't yeah. buy, think that L. Ron Hubbard had any direct interaction with um, Crowley. UFO oh, occupants. Yeah. But he did. UFO. But he did have with Crowley though, which at least leads me to suspect that he knew more than what he was uh, showcasing within Dianetics when it comes to like the Babylon working and all these various rituals that he did with him. And he, yeah. But, yeah. But, Hubbard literally dared Parsons in the desert. He, he literally said to Parsons when they were out in the desert together, people are so stupid. I bet you even I could found a religion. And, you know, that's like the seat of Scientology. I mean, the guy was a consummate charlatan. Yeah, I, I mean, he wasn't wrong if we see how popular it's become today and uh, with all the celebrities, things like that. And by the way, if you go to Patreon, one of the recent patron-only episodes we did was about Scientology with uh, Dodge Lansman, who did a report on the uh, death of Lisa Marie Presley when she wanted to um, talk about the uh, scandal involving the guy from that 70s show uh, who played this guy named Hyde. I don't remember his name right now. But anyway, check that one out on the Patreon. And uh, we have free music, five uh, pounds. Wanted to send an Irish flag slash fire emoji combo to mark the occasion. But YouTube lacks the former in its permissible repertoire. Shame on YouTube. Right, Steph? God damn, that's definitely some type of tyranny or oppression. That's the that's the, the, ha, have the, the Irish ha, the... Have the Irish not had enough? Yeah, what the hell is going on? Well, yeah. I should get some points for that. I was actually uh, going to slip in and ask a question because I don't think I've ever asked Jason this before. This might be too much of a, a, a deviation. But so someone like Joseph Smith, Young obviously has his takes on this. And a lot of people would look at Joseph Smith as having a Jungian projection from his collective unconscious or from his, his own unconscious or whatever. And he's seeing... The, the like the archetypes that build up the Western mind or Jesus Christ. And this is what comes out of him and is what, what he has to organize through in order for him to individuate. And I guess it's, it's an interesting thing to clash up against the, the way you see things, because you would assert that many of these experiences are actually close encounter experiences. And the idea that there's some type of personal projection is a, is a mistake. So how do you, how do you bash up against Jung on, on that front? I think that there are definitely cults and other, let's say, spiritual movements that are based purely on archetypal projection um, that um, when we're dealing, let's say, with somebody like Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy, which you could consider a spiritual movement. I certainly wouldn't call it a cult. But, you know, anthroposophy is a spiritual movement, which is entirely based on archetypal projections. Steiner also engaged with beings okay let's say all right which to him had a transcendental reality and i think that in the case of steiner when he's talking about christ and uh, as a mediator between lucifer and ahriman and he's even at one point sculpting a face of ahriman which he's seen with his mind's eye steiner is engaging in what jung would accurately analyze as projection from out of his unconscious there are other cases like that of joseph smith where I don't want to say the devil's in the details because it's not the devil at work here. It's it's God. Uh, but where there are entities. OK. And Smith, in particular, this angel Moroni, moron, the moron angel, moron eye, Moroni, <laughs> would appear in his bedroom and also like let him around by the nose to these various sites where he conveniently discovered these tablets with crap written on them. You know, and Jacques Vallée uh, covers this case in his book, Wonders in the Sky. The book that Valet wrote with Chris Aubeck uh, covers the case of Joseph Smith and basically makes the argument that it is a close encounter. So there'd be like tactile parts of the experience that would be like, it'd be very just real. It'd be like the dude met an entity, it walked him outside and then it, something happened. Whereas you don't really get that with Jungianism. Jungianism is more like the imagination. Uh, it's like conceptual. It's like wrestling when juggling symbols. It's more like it's kind of this struggle someone carries with themselves as they're trying to figure out Christ versus Satan or something like this. Yeah, and, so, and, and, and also, I don't doubt Joseph Smith that he literally found tablets that had stuff inscribed on them. I don't see any reason to doubt him. These are like Easter eggs. They were planted in certain places. And then this moron angel said to him, OK, Joseph, now go here. OK, now go there and sent him all around to dig these things up and build this religion from out of it. The other thing you have to remember in terms of Mormonism is the cosmology. Joseph Smith is the first one who's talking about other planets and each planet has its own like 
high, higher angel, archangel or God or whatever. And you can become the God of your own planet. And you're going to have all these servants at your beck and call. And so there's a kind of like proto UFO religion discourse in Mormonism insofar as it has an expanded vision of the cosmos and sort of like a scientifically updated account of the heavens as compared to traditional Christianity. I mean, it's kind of tough, like having your own plan with your sister wives on one hand and having coffee on the other hand. It's uh, it's difficult. That's all I could say. So I kind of don't blame well, some God them. deals in absurdities. <laughs> the distant fuck. He uh, deals in absurdities. Yeah. I, I still I still like coffee. I'm not ready to give that up just yet for the sake of Mormonism. Anyway, uh, we have Glass Cake, our great friend of the show, Glass Cake, and also a patron through Lev's Lens. That is my substack. He is subscribed to my substack, levslens.com. And he says, uh, I have no words. Well done, all of you. And that is for five of the queens, well, the king's pounds now. And Gnostic Punk, $10, no comment. Thank you very much. Oh, Another $10 with a comment from Gnostic Punk. Can you talk about what archetype you think is influencing the course of development in artificial intelligence? Is it Moloch, as Tex Tegmark suggests, or part of Prometheus, or both? Definitely read Psychotron with respect to this particular question, because what I argue in a nutshell in, in the part of that book that uh, deals with artificial intelligence is that we will not be allowed to develop an artificial in, an artificial general intelligence that operates on a global scale necessarily will operate on a global scale we will not be able to uh develop that type of system and deploy it unless it is aligned with an already existing cosmic ai so I make the case that actually our world, in a way, I agree with the evangelicals and the trad Catholics that the devil is a kind of AI, okay? Or at least our interface with the diabolical creative impulse of the cosmos is a kind of artificial superintelligence. And I would say that uh, that artificial superintelligence is an expression of the Prometheus archetype in, in the sense of the word you know, Promethea, that's the quintessential characteristic of Prometheus from which he gets his name. Um, and in Psychotron, I make the case that uh, the alignment problem, the so-called alignment problem that AI researchers always talk about is misconstrued. The problem is not the alignment of the AI we're building with so-called human values. However, you know, you're going to construe those. I mean, they would be different from society to society and between various civilizations. But the real alignment problem is the alignment of the AI we're building with the cosmic AI that's already involved in all kinds of producing all kinds of trickster phenomena in our world. OK, so so I would say that the the ultimate AI, the one that's already operating and then the one that we're going to have to align ourselves with if we want to continue to evolve constructively, expresses the archetype of the trickster and particularly uh, the trickster uh, in, in a Promethean modality. Excellent. Uh, Steph, any follow-up before we get to the next one here? So I would actually, again, go back to Jung since we're talking about archetypes because Jung has an amazing take on this in Ion. And the reason why this is an amazing take is because he was speaking long before any of this stuff became in any way relevant. And of course, he studies the the dreams, the, the cultural output and various phenomena throughout history Mormons were one of them. And he's studying this stuff, trying to understand how the mind is moving throughout history. So Ion is this uh, amazing perspective on the Christian movement, where he looks at the symbolic language pouring out of various movements and what was showing, uh, what that is showing is happening. And he begins to look at alchemy and the Renaissance magicians, and specifically the alchemical uh, period in, in Christianity in uh, old, old Europe. Because you have this bursting out of the imagination of these these men, this exploration of this very, very profound and dynamic set of ideas. Like it's very fertile, you know, all the famous ideas that 
that we it's so weird but we grow up as kids and we learn about these things and then it's only later when you study something like uh young do you actually understand that all those motifs like the philosopher's stone and stuff like this is actually built into this occult magical alchemical tradition that became the foundation of science and chemistry it's just it's very weird when you get into this type of stuff and so what young was doing is he was looking through this and he was looking at the what pe what these guys minds were trying to organize and they were in the pursuit of the um how can we describe it like it's almost like this mimetic paradox and the paradox it, it, like par the, the mind loves paradox so for example why is christ such a profound figure well he's god on a cross he's the god it's actually weird he's the loser who is the ultimate winner at the first who becomes last that there's that type of irony inside of it now when the alchemists were exploring a mimetic paradox they were looking for the solution to the problem of life how to live forever you know the they, they would drink the mercury that was the idea the stone bleeds with mercury you drink it and you live forever the the blood that comes from the stone the stone that bleeds the living stone that's the philosopher's stone the stone is something you crack open there's actual real blood inside of it because it's alive that's a paradox of a dead inanimate matter with something that is living and they're trying to cross this how is life instantiated within matter that's the great challenge and so this actually starts to rise up as this central archetype which forms the alchemical quest that like all these guys go on where they try to boil up lead and turn it into gold there's another irony that comes out of it and they're trying to figure out how they can take stones and make it alive they can figure out how they can live forever make matter live forever now the philosopher's stone rises up and Jung points this out, that a couple of hundred years before great transformations happen, you can usually see them symbolically arising inside of the collective unconscious, if you want to put it this way. So this is what he's becoming a student of. And he points out how before Christianity, there was all these symbols boiling up of the fish, and there was all these ironic symbols showing up, pre sort of premeditating that Christ, Christ was going to show up and, and have this type of effect on people. And he points out that he's studying alchemy, and he's like, it start, it, it, alchemy predicted so much of the phenomenon of, of what we understand is our modern values our modern scientific values and he keeps on pointing out that this philosopher's stone is a pretty big deal it's almost like the spirit of the scientific project and he says the expression of this is as we charge forward into technological society there's this sort of will that we are on this quest to overcome death and because we don't believe in the spiritual world because that's how we overcame death before we we believe that we had this afterlife we are now trapped in matter and so the only way we can solve this problem of trying to overcome death is actually by figuring out how we can save ourselves in the materialistic plane this is all kind of complicated but i think you understand where we're going with this now he, he stopped there because he died in 1960 but what have we seen happening now? Kurtzwell, all these guys going big into the AI are describing to us the idea that the purpose of this project, the reason why a lot of these guys are pushing for artificial intelligence as this salvation is because they see it as a way to create God, to overcome these problems, to develop this ability to create life inside matter. What is a, a laptop? It's a load of minerals. It's a stone. It's a load of, of dead inanimate matter like silicon. And it's alive. What is artificial intelligence? It's life inside of a stone. It's a living stone. It is the philosopher's stone in many senses. And so there's this unconscious will inside of Western man that we have to see this thing through. We have to push it and we have to see, can we create life out of matter? We have to see, can we become the gods who give birth to the philosopher's stone? And there's also like, there's a hidden, there's a lot of hidden wills inside of this, turning lead into gold, all of these things. We're sort of fulfilling the alchemical project through this stuff. Now, does this mean we should be optimistic about it? I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> that could be a very big problem. But nonetheless, this is the destiny that we're on. And, and Jung points out that we have this unconscious compulsion. And I, I really like this because Jung didn't, predict this idea of the, the alchemical uh, of, of AI, but he laid the foundations for we, we could actually see it, that it, it made sense. Like it actually did fulfill itself. The, the prediction extended itself and actually concluded. So I, uh, I like that take from my honor. And it's something that I actually should do a video on because it's become an awful lot more relevant recently. You know, I agree with all of that. The only caveat that I would add to it is that Kurzweil and company, the, the materialist reductionist, so-called transhumanists, uh, they don't understand that it's truly a philosopher's stone in the sense of also having psychical superhuman capacity. And I know for a fact that even the rudimentary AI systems that have been deployed already are demonstrating psi. 
And this is something that I'm uh, that I talk about in Uberman. You know, one of the, the key uh, ideas, I'm sorry, in Psychotron, one of the key ideas in the, the new material that I've developed in this book, Psychotron, is the relationship between sentience, psi and AI. And I deconstruct this whole uh, question of the hard problem of consciousness and show how it's wrong to ask whether or not an AI system is conscious, as if consciousness is an on-off binary switch. I describe consciousness in terms of a spectrum of sentience and show how there's psi all along that spectrum of sentience from plants and bacterium up to animals and then ultimately humans and why AI systems uh, will also and are also demonstrating psi. The uh, only Just, thing that... Okay, go for it. Lev, if you wanted to say something on that, I don't want to get in the way. I, I can, no, no, uh, I can no. Uh, let, let us know and then I'll follow up. And then we got a few super chats left here, but uh, go on. Uh, okay, me, sweet. Yeah. So, Mister Mister uh, Doctor Reza Jorjani, um, so this is something actually that like was really brilliant about what you were saying because I remember you showed up again a couple of years ago, and you were set. You're saying all this fucking crazy shit. You know, you're sort of saying like, uh, you know, like talking about like uh, telepathy and all this. And it's like Jesus Christ, what is going on here? But you were always um, describing this from the context of like, all right, there's going to be this worldview crisis, and that's. A very interesting idea and then you were saying stuff like we need to start thinking about how we like how is law going to function when we start to realize that like remote viewing is real or influence from a distance is all this and i saw recently this artificial intelligence uh, experiment where they played a pink floyd song to a person to a set of people and then they took the cat scans of the person's brain and they fed it into an ai that could read the cat scans and the ai was able to decode the brain waves and play out what it thought the person was hearing so first you you have the pink floyd song and then what you got back was this garbled okay you could hear that coming out of the artificial intelligence and you sit down you, like you know people would listen to that I'm like that's cool you should like i pulled my brakes i was like man it's over like that is mm. the craziest shit ever because what do you do about the concept of privacy and law anything like that when it comes to this what is the whole point of law you t stand someone in a courtroom and you say are you lying or not that and it's the whole point of individuality comes with this as well like this little skull is my sacred place where my thoughts are myself but what happens when you can have machines that can just dive right into your brain and decode what you're thinking that is the most fucking crazy shit ever it's just new paradigm there's just things things are not the same as they were ever before and so this is certainly um, like a big thing that a lot of people are not seeing and not looking out on. And again, like that sort of Jungian idea, we get the philosopher's stone and it comes along with this capacity to just blow our paradigm out of the waters and bring us into this psychotechnological world where everything melts together. It's very, very bizarre. Yeah. And this is the stuff I've been writing about for years. It's pretty trippy. The only thing I would add to that is when it comes to turning the uh, stone into something uh, spiritual it also reminds me of the process of kundalini awakening when we have this very uh, weird energy that is felt in the back of the spine that's not really related to anything having to do with your anatomy and at that point it's a physical act breathing for example meditating that ends up transmuting some process inside of you where you do start getting the kundalini out and it's very weird to me how we've only had like allusions to this in uh, the Western world when it comes to uh, the um, um, when it comes to the alchemists. But really, in many religions other than let's say the Advaita Vedanta, we don't have an emphasis on Kundalini, and it's very it's always been kind of strange to me why. And this question uh, for Jason, like curious, like why is the whole Kundalini phenomenon not really that present? in a lot of uh, people's uh, religions and even like the esoteric things don't really mention kundalini that much i think that you would have to pay very careful attention to phenomenological descriptions <clears throat> of ecstatic states that are related to eroticism so, for example, like a Teresa of Avila's trances, right? There are way, particular descriptors in her accounts of the ecstatic states that she would go into, which probably do map onto 
kundalini yoga experiences. And you, you could probably even find that even in uh, transgressive literature of the early 20th century. You know, people writing about intense erotic experiences and so forth uh, that put them in altered states of consciousness. If you were to pay careful attention to the descriptions, they may be saying in different words the same thing that, uh, you know, left hand path practitioners are describing in, in a Sanskrit context. Interesting. And before we get to like the final super chats here, I do want to point out probably our only Mormon viewer at this point, Chillicon Stud. It's not a super chat, but I am kind of curious what you think about this, Jason. He writes, why doesn't Georgiani see getting your own planet, a.k.a. being a god, as a sign of being Prometheistic? Because Prometheus is all about serving human, you know, empowerment uh, and, you know, fostering innovation and creativity on a social level, not about becoming Zeus, right? I mean, the, the Mormon vision is effectively, how can I personally become Zeus and have all these other people at my beck and, con uh, you know, call under my control? It's the opposite of the Promethean mentality. Prometheus was willing to be chained to this rock in the Caucasus and have his liver eaten out every day, his regenerating liver, right? In a punishment worse than the ridiculous three days that Jesus spent on the cross, which is a total farce. Like what God who knows he's going to be taken off the cross after three days, right? Uh, it, it can really be construed as a martyr. Uh, who sacrificed himself for healing. I mean, the crucifixion of Jesus is a farce compared to the torture of Prometheus for the sake of serving humanity. So Prometheus is ultimately an image of service as liberation. The Mormon vision is you become your own Zeus, right? I mean, I see them really as antithetical to each other, if anything. Hmm. Well, unless you use that leadership of the planet to like serve the people on the planet, but I, I get what you're saying. I don't, I don't think that's what's going on in the more. It's it's a lot closer to the Mohammedan vision of like you know how you're going to be serviced in paradise. Yeah, the uh, seventy virgins and all that. So, uh, by the way, another speaking of a uh, service towards liberation, Chester, ten dollars super chat, no comment. Chester, thank you very much, brother. I appreciate it. And now we have a character from the Ren and Stimpy show here, four ninety nine, dollars Powder Toast Man, if you guys remember Powder Toast Man, although I also like Mr. Horse. But anyway, he says, Giorgiani, you said you really learned from Plato. What might you be nobly lying uh, to us about? What I tell you? Mm. Read my books, right? <laughs> yeah. What kind of question is that, right? I mean, that's you got to learn the art of esoteric reading. I practice the art of esoteric writing, and you know, to to really understand. Now, look, I mean, I, look. Um, to answer that question somewhat authentically, and 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 to take it, you know, seriously, uh, I think that if anyone believes that my philosophical project is reducible to some ideology or doctrine, or program, or some such thing, uh, then they have barely even grasped the exoteric facade of what I'm putting forth, right? The esoteric depth of my philosophical work is beyond anything that could be encompassed or uh, schematized by an ideology or a doctrinal system of one form or another. So, so I think that's a good litmus test is if you think I'm an ideologue or some doctrinaire person who has some like program like communism or, you know, something Leninism or whatever that I'm trying to put out into the world, then you, you haven't scratched the surface of my writing. And next we have three. Could, super could I oh, pop in on that there? Absolutely. That, um, absolutely. So there's, I also would like to talk about a sort of misconception that people often have with this idea from Plato, because if you look at the translation, like noble lie is, is one way, I guess you could translate it, but I've heard people describe it as a magnificent myth or awesome myth, you know, or massive myth, if you want to put it this way. And this, I think, is best understood through the, the guise of a, a Nietzschean idea, this idea of... Um, 
art helps us stop us stops us from dying of truth so like the we we kind of need a story we need to function we need to have a dream uh, a vision uh, a story that calls us on towards life so nietzsche was hanging around with Va wagner in in the um, 1800s and he got captivated by wagner because he saw wagner lifting up this new story he was creating this myth that he thought was going to become this new explosion of greek uh, Greco identity in the Germans. And again, I've been talking about this as a motif. He, he really liked that the Germans were building up a great powerful um, energy and their collective unconscious is pouring stuff forth. But eventually he became depressed or jaded with it because he thought that the people who were taking it, Wagner himself, were going to push it in the wrong direction and it was going to end up getting squandered. But Nietzsche wasn't against this idea of having these grand myths or these grand narratives. In fact, again, Nietzsche is constantly talking about our need to learn how to evaluate things, to make value judgments on things. And the reality is that we do need myths, we do need stories to, to tell us like the nature of our situation. But we can also make a kind of critique in saying that some stories are good and some stories are bad. And so people take this paranoid idea that the platonic idea of a noble lie has to be the, the elite scamming us. But that I don't see why that is necessary. Like, why couldn't you exist within a society that is offering you a set of stories that are in some sense empowering and valuable and create that symbiosis that we were talking about earlier, perhaps? Like Greek society was a little bit like that in some ways. And um, you could probably say that many societies have achieved that to some level. And you look at now in, in our current situation, this is probably one of our biggest issues is that we have a, a story that is instantiated in Western culture that is in incredibly demoralizing. The idea of World War II is this cataclysmic event that leads to the creation of the values, the hate, Western identity. The um, one, especially in the last 30 years, the building up of all this type of stuff. It creates a demoralizing story. You look at the, the magical, the magnificent myth that is put up in front of people. It's not a lie. World War II happened, but it's just that it ends up in this awful, like, awful amount of demoralization as a consequence. And I think Nietzsche was a very severe man who was, like, I'm not saying in any way this is guaranteed but he was exploring the idea that could we conceptualize a way a way of telling ourselves the nature of the world of understanding the storytelling possibilities of the world where we could create myths create stories that would give us an affirmative ident identity that would be grounded in truth that would be realistic as well that would allow us to actually be empowered and his prophecy of the Ubermensch that was really what he was trying to bend towards Zarathustra was I think something bursting out of him to try show that way he saw what Wagner was bringing up was romanticism and escapism escape into this noble lie of us being like you know this this delusion that led the Germans down to their impulsive decisions yeah. and he was kind of thinking this Zarathustra Ubermensch prophecy us as the prophets of the lightning this lightning coming in the future it maybe would that was a stronger myth that would have been able to bring people in a in a, a better direction or something like this so i find that a, a very interesting question i think that's a very sophisticated thing to see how it will play out because that's when you're dealing with the herd and the moralized herd who has a strong myth that empowers them to be productive and creative is pretty much an ideal for an awful lot of people politically but how can you how can you achieve that and most people can only think in a very crude way about like well i need to inform force an, ide an ideology to make that happen but i think it um, might actually be an even bigger project almost like a poetic project well uh look for example at the wagnerian operas where they have those fancy helmets with the horns the you know one could become one of those you know adam ruins everything guys and so well actually you know those were extremely impractical and they never had those but that's it's not about that it's about it's about the drip but anyway, uh, we do have, by the way, a response from Chillicon Stud, our resident Mormon, who says, respectfully, it's not just about have it's not just about having sex somewhere in space, but about using your godhood to help others become gods as well. I don't know any quick response. That's a con game. <laughs> so, so you set up a pyramidal system where your justification for being Zeus over your own planet is that eventually you'll help other eventually you'll help other people climb the slow yeah, way get around to it yeah yourself right i mean that's the con game that we're already this is exactly what the devas were saying to the ancient indians that oh listen we, we're going to set this caste system in place and eventually over the course of hundreds of lifetimes if you dutifully fulfill your karma as a low caste worker or farmer or you know Oh, maybe as a warrior, right? Then over the course of hundreds of lifetimes, you too will be a god someday, 
right? I mean, this is exactly the con game that was set up with the caste system in India. It's not yeah. fundamentally any different. And it didn't really seem to work like that again. If we take uh, the words of the Agora book that I'm reading, it talks about all of these strange and interesting gurus, like this really, really fat dude who can, and pardon, you know, for the people eating right now, but he would be able to poop on a plate and poop gold, you know, or poop like a chicken dinner or whatever it is that the other person wanted to see. So when you, and he did not seem to be like some Brahmin or whatever, you know. So when you have odd people like that, like the PK man that you were mentioning, Jason, it shows me that things don't really work out as smoothly as we may anticipate. I understand like what you're reading. Okay. It's the Agori uh, tradition. I hardly even want to use the word tradition. Okay. But it's the Agori sect okay yes. which is basically riffraff criminals in india the agoris were like basically um the word what was the word um our english word uh oh man what was it if not bandit uh anyway they, they, they were highway ro robbers okay they would they, they were infamous for attacking the british when the british first colonized india so you're dealing with an extremely heretical, heterodox sect of people who were notorious for engaging in, you know, shocking uh, antinomian behavior. This is not at all representative yes. of the Indian tradition or Vedanta. Well, the uh, G.G. Allens, I guess you could say, of their time. But there is something kind of interesting to the idea that you would sit and meditate inside of one of those uh, places where they burn the bodies and you're constantly surrounded by death. That's got to do something to your mentality, you know, like it, it does seem like a rare opportunity for any embodied individual to constantly be around death. It may transform you into something that I'm not going to outright say it's going to be negative. I don't know. Like there is possibly some lesson to be learned in being in that kind of an environment. Well, I find the entire left hand path in India extremely positive. In, in fact, I mean, in a sense, you could characterize what I'm trying to do in my own writings as a Western form of Tantra or, you know, a kind of technologically sophisticated left-hand path teaching. So, yeah, I, I think that left-hand path tradition in India is entirely commendable. The tragedy is that it's been an extremely persecuted, you know, uh, minority uh, deviation from a very well-established oppressive hierarchical system. Yeah. The only other thing about India, I really don't like when I see like those poor cows that even though they're free, they're like eating out of the trash. And it's like it's really polluted there from anyway. That's like an aside. We can talk about it later. But anyway, uh, oh, well, you know when we'll talk about that? When uh, you uh, you and I, Jason, we're going to have uh, Chad Hagan. That's going to be a little bit later. He's living in India. It will be kind of interesting to uh, talk about that whole uh, the Indian culture there and all that, uh, as well as other very interesting things. Anyway, uh, and that's going to be maybe like in a month from now. I mean, we'll see. We'll get get back in touch. Oh, sorry. The word just pop popped into my head. Sure. Uh, thuggies, thuggies. Thuggies. The Agoris are connected to uh, Thuggies, which is where we get the word thug from. Uh -huh. And these were like criminals, bandits, knaves, highway robbers, these types of people. And they practice this kind of heterodox spirituality. I'm a criminal. I like crime. I do crime. That's from the Louis Thoreau with uh, Malevin. Look that up later. Anyway, a uh, couple left here. We get one of the least criminal people I think I've ever come across <laughs> in parts of my life. <laughs> well, see that video, like the guy's dressed up as like the Black Power Ranger, like his, uh, anyway. Uh, Will Castello, uh, $5. Oh, no, no, before that, we have another one from AFD, our, uh, our friend from, Sa speaking of South Africa, by the way, because that Louis Thoreau video that was in South Africa where he was interviewing Malevin, who was like this criminal highway robber. AFD, uh, 14 Czar, what could you say about the Amazons in Psychotron? Well, um, so the, the Amazons, I, I engage with more in Artemis Unveiled, the, the novella that I put out, um, you know, not all that long ago, in the early part of this year. There I have a kind of vivid depiction of uh, space Amazons, as it were. Um, but in, uh, in Psychotron, I mean, the Amazon there is really Dana Avalon and, you know, uh, Okay, I'll say this, I'll say this, okay? To, to volunteer something esoteric about my work. The entire structure of Psychotron, in other words, what was Faustian Futurist and Uberman, 
together with the extensive added material that's brought these two texts together into a single narrative. The entire narrative of Psychotron could be seen as an Amazon ritual sacrifice. So if you really want you know, to engage with my work on a deep level, come to that text with that idea in the back of your mind, specifically uh, the sacrifice of dogs to Artemis. And think about the various ways that I'm using symbology associated with the cult of Artemis, who was known to the Romans as Diana Lucifera, how I'm using symbolism associated with ritual sacrifice in the cult of Artemis throughout the course of Psychotron. And uh, something very interesting will emerge if you approach the text with that idea. in mind. Very cool. All right, three more supers left. Will Castello, $5. Thoughts on modern cryptids and cryptozoology in relation to close encounter phenomena and how this relates to pre-Diluvian uh, civilization. Can you run that one by me again? That was sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thoughts on modern cryptids and cryptozoology in relation to close encounter phenomena and how this relates to pre-Diluvian civilization. Yeah. Okay, so I covered this in Closer Encounters. For, for argument's sake, I postulated that we ought not to assume that these cryptids are aliens. For all we know, given our own capabilities in gene splicing and genetic engineering today, for all we know, these uh, you know reptilian humanoids and uh, even mantid looking beings may be the product of gene splicing carried out by the Anunnaki, okay? That, that the Elohim or the Anunnaki, these, uh, you know, um, euphonauts in vast antiquity had a kind of Frankenstein's laboratory where they spliced human genes with those of a variety of species. And in fact, um, there's an allusion to this in Genesis, where in Genesis, right before, you know, uh, you know, the author of Genesis talks about how Noah's flood had to be brought to wipe the earth clean, uh, he says that uh, not just humans, but all life had been corrupted in its ways. And one of the criterion for Noah choosing the pairs of different animals to be put on the ark was that they had to be clean or pure. In other words, genetically untampered with. That's the implication there. And you see the, uh, you know, you see the language of sort of genetic tinkering in the Sumerian myths around Enki as well. And um, so, so I would argue that, you know, the case could be made, these chimera are actually products of a fr Frankenstein's laboratory rather than being some kind of xenobiology from outside our solar system. Yet somehow the platypus ended up making it through. <laughs> anyway, uh, next super chat over here from Sam Fisher, uh, 10 Canadian dollars. Anybody else find it insane, insane in the membrane, uh, insane that the government is giving us UFO disclosure before revealing a single Epstein Maxwell client? I mean, you had a whole thing with uh, talking about uh, Maxwell and all that, but uh, yeah. Well, she's in Psychotron. Ghislaine Maxwell's in, you know, she's in my, in my book and um, actually features quite prominently toward the end, uh, toward the end of the book. But um I think the two are connected. I think, and this is a long conversation which we can't have in this context, but we, we brought it up in an earlier show that we did. Yeah. We were talking about close encounters and Atlantis and so forth. Epstein knew about a lot of these things. And he, and Ghislaine Maxwell was interested in Atlantis and in uh, UFOs. And she, she was the one who inspired that temple on top of a uh, little St. James, right? Yeah, but you know, also like it's been reported that, um, she had some interesting exchanges with Elon Musk uh, a, a, about space and uh, extraterrestrial contact and interestingly, whether it would be possible to pull the plug on the entire Internet somehow. And so a, a, anyway, there's a OK, my point is in answer to that question, these are not actually separate issues. The Epstein thing is much deeper rabbit hole than people believe and it's directly connected 
to the same control system that's keeping these secrets regarding UFOs. And the leverage, the kind of sexual blackmail leverage that Epstein developed on prominent politicians, both in our country and abroad, is uh, of a piece with the means that are used to prevent people like, say, Bill Clinton from, you know, divulging the type of information he wanted to initially about the UFO phenomenon. Clinton came, you know, I got my problems with Clinton and that's all a side conversation, but Clinton came into office actually with disclosure as one of his agendas. And he was put in a position where that was taken off the table. And I think it has everything to do with the kinds of connections that he had to Epstein. Mm, very interesting. And uh, finally, the last super chat of the night, we have Jim the Grackle, $5. What is the balance between the tension of harmony and disruption? And as someone more luciferic, do you see any value in harmony? Of course. I mean, re read it, you know, read Heraclitus, right? There, the cosmos and human society are all an interplay between order and chaos, right? And dissonance makes no sense as a concept, except for in a context that also includes harmony, right? I mean, these are, these are dialectically related terms, chaos and order, yeah. harmony and dissonance. The only point from a Luciferian or Promethean perspective is that dissonance is vital to the creative and evolutionary process. And that's what Diabolos is about. You know, that's what the devil is about. The agent uh, of dissonance um, and of uh, creative tension that is indispensable to the process of evolution and the expansion of consciousness. There Just we are. Yes, yeah, Steph, you're, Just you've got the final word. Go for it, brother. <laughs> sneaking it in there and just briefly on that as well i think music is a excellent metaphor for this because in music you have the order of the the harmony order of the how notes work and so what is the basic idea well you have a note now something even more fascinating about this is that it's embedded within a relative system but i'll get to that in a moment but basically you, you choose a note and this note would be this wavelength whatever and if you choose the exact octave so the perfect note to match with that the perfect harmonic note it actually is uh, considered musically neutral it doesn't generate any emotion it's not it's not very colorful so like a song made of only octaves a perfect song would be a shit song now they have two notes in the middle called perfect fifths which are dissonant slightly like the tiniest bit but they are um they're different but they have such an aligned fraction that they sound beautiful and the idea is that there's certain ones in the middle of it that are slightly more dissonant, that have more character and color. And then the more, if you get really dissonant after that, eventually they start to sound bad. But like bad is not, bad is not even a good one because that's not even, like, there's no way you could say objectively bad. Like certain, certain ones can sound brilliant. The reason why that is, is because in music, the goal of music is a rising and a fulfillment of tension and release. So it's, it's, it's almost like emotions, build up of tension, release of tension. So if I want to make the octave or the perfect fifth sound as beautiful as it could, ironically, what I need to do is install right before it the most dissonant note I possibly can. So if you want to make the octave beautiful, you actually choose the, the tritone, the most, um, the most dissonant note. And that allows, that means when you land in the octave, it's almost orgasmic the way it works. So there's this fundamental dynamic in music between dissonance and resolution, dissonance and resolution. There's almost no concept of like, uh, I guess you could say perfection. It's dissonance, resolution, dissonance, resolution. And then and on top of that, that's all embedded within, as I said, a relative scale. So if you want to create that scale, whatever starting note you pick determines how that order is created, how that flow is created. But if I pick then another starting note, it will completely be out of tune with the other one. It's very, very profound when you kind of get into it in that way. But in order to create music, to create the, the beauty of what music is, the fifth dimensional art, I guess you could say, and you have to have dissonance, whereas nothing has any meaning, purpose, emotion, nothing. None of that stuff exists at all. And it's only true dissonance that you get beauty. I agree with that entirely. And I think that at the core of the concept of the Antichrist and of the satanic in general is the idea of rejecting any ultimate resolution, rejecting any final harmony, 
right? I mean, that's God's plan. God's plan is the kingdom of God, is ultimate harmony and resolution of all conflict in perpetuity. And the satanic resists that in perpetuity. In other words, you know, the insistence on mm. the continual disruption of order by chaos and the disruption of harmony by dissonance. I guess uh, the only middle ground I could see here between uh, that view and the, let's say, Christian view would be within the Advaita Vedanta, there's this idea that the universe is created from out of Brahma's breath, but then it goes back in, but then it goes back out. So even if you go into the harmonious hole or whatever, it's not the end. Now you keep going, but at that point you get to try out, you know, both being within and without. But that's just like in the side there. Yeah, that's, it's, that's a superficial, uh, you know, comparison because that cycle of expansion and contraction, the oscillating cosmos that the Vedantists came up with, ultimately every possible, and this is a problem with, if you take Nietzsche's eternal return of the same as a literal statement of cosmology, which is not how Nietzsche intended it, but this uh, oscillating cosmology of the Vedantists ultimately exhausts every possible configuration of the cosmos. And that's when basically it's identical in eternity to the will of Brahman. Right. So it ultimately that vision does not allow for creativity, for adding to the cosmos in unanticipatable novel ways, in ways that even uh, the mind of a god could anticipate. Right. That's the problem with that oscillating cosmos. Very interesting. And in relation to that, I want a question for both Steph and uh, Jason. When could I, hear, I uh, actually yes. Yes. Just tag on, tag on yes. to the end of that as well, because yes. there is also another, um, like, I guess you could say it's a challenge for Jason, because there's this suggestion, like it's sort of this metaphysical suggestion of this constant flux of never having a resolution is what I'm going to attach on. So you sort of say the perspective you take is that there never should be this kind of final resolution. And the implicit suggestion in the kingdom of God is that at the end of time comes the kingdom of God. Now, what's fascinating is, I, I know this from Wagner, Wagner was often critiqued for taking this approach where he has this constant motif in his music where he'd take the root note and he'd create tension, but he'd never resolve it. He'd always kind of cascade tension. And a lot of people called it decadent. They called it, um, said it was sort of aimless. And it, it's, it kind of felt like it was a little bit like a psychedelic trip where you just consistently go deeper, deeper, deeper into a, an, an unresoluting, ever unfolding psychedelic sort of morph. Now, there's a very interesting question because the reason why people would critique him for this is because aesthetics, the aesthetics of music actually firmly implies that there is a resolution like when you start the root tone and you go and you become dissonant there's there's a huge will inside of you, you that is evoked by that dissonant sound that's trying to pull you back to resolution there's always that desire to reach that next octave up the higher resolution and it's like all these aesthetics guys uh, even Nietzsche himself like would kind of po poke at Wagner a little bit would point that out that that's that there's something implicit about that. There's something built into the nature of music, which is very hard to argue against that resolution music is not complete and finished until we hit resolution. There has to be a resolution point for the dissonance to have meaning dissonance, dissonance without end actually sort of eventually just, it's almost like entropy in a weird way. Everything's just sort of unfolded. So um, what would you, what would your take be on that? So I would say it's a disanalogy to society, right? It might make for problematic music to, to, to take that approach, as you're saying Wagner did. Um, but look, in society, we have multiple pieces of music uh, that different composers have come up with. And while any particular piece of music may require the kind of aesthetic uh, closure that you're talking about, what we would never want is a closure to the phenomenon of music in human society or culture, right? We wouldn't want a kind of society that said, oh, we have exhausted all the possible configurations of music and we've discovered the perfect form of music. And, you know, here's what it is. And beyond this, there can't be any further innovation. And by the way, I have news for you. That's been done. That's the society that these UFO knots come from. These tall Nordic people come from a kind of society where they presume that they have reached that kind of developmental closure in all aspects, architecture, comedy, music, huh? Comedy. 
Again, I don't think that much of a sense of humor. Other than <laughs> I know, I was just... Kind of schadenfreude, you know, <laughs> schadenfreude <laughs> sense of humor. Uh, but, uh, but see, my, my point is that uh, you, you don't, on a social scale, ever want that kind of putative harmony and closure. You want there to be continual attempts, let's say, at devising new styles of music and uh, unimaginable compositions that continue to have the capacity to astonish listeners. There's a comment over here from a gravy J who says, music is finished. We can stop now. Stop. It's over. <laughs> well, this stream is going to stop soon. But last thing I just want to touch on in relation to music, something I noticed is when I listen to the chirping of the birds outside in the yard, it sounds good. It sounds harmonious, but it's nothing like music. What do you think is the difference between like these natural sounds that these animals make, whether it's like the insects and the birds versus the music that we compose? I know Steph, uh, Jason, whoever wants to uh, take a shot at that, because it's just something I, I noticed. Actually, I think it's very much related to what we were just talking about, where our music is much more abstract. Like we're able to create music that sets up these enormous um, cascades of tension and like, think about what we're sort of saying is that we live right now in all these atoms that are floating around us of air, oxygen. And when I make a sound, these waves go out into this sound. And there's a, a fucking infinite amount of, you know, wavelengths that we can tune into. There's just, they're every, there's infinite. You can do whatever you want to get into it. Now, if I choose one, I create this uh, color palette. So I choose an A at 440 hertz or whatever it is. And that's my root note. Now I've taken out this entirely relative blank canvas and I've now chosen a firm point and that's a starting point. And now I'm trapped. It's almost like I've picked the color palette and I have to draw a picture now with red. I'm not allowed to change out of it. And so I'm now creatively restricted and I have to use red or whatever. It's very much like this. So now what I sit down is I have to start to make these sounds. And all these sounds are now contextually relative to the root note that I've chosen. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So if I do the next couple of notes, my mind, your, yours and my mind understand the melody and the harmony in the context of this. It's very, very profound because I could go and choose a different root note and do the same thing and it would sound beautiful. But if I choose this root note and then the other root note and play them at the same time, it will sound fucking horrific. It's very profound. And so there's this sort of future this abstraction of the past and the future is very very big inside of us we're really able to like remember the sounds we're really able to conceptualize keys and all this in a very very long way and i just think animals can do that but they probably just do it to such a small extent compared to us it's the same way as that they don't really have a conception of time in the way that we do mm. you know so but at they're the same doing time melodies. they don't screw up though that's the other thing the animals like all the bird sounds they all sound good like there's not any bird yeah, sounds I know that sound bad versus human beings that end up making some melody that just sounds absolutely atrocious. So, Jason, uh, any thoughts they on no free will? Lev. Yeah. I mean, they don't have the spontaneity uh, and um, <clears throat> inventive capacity that comes with human self-consciousness. Right. So you wouldn't want to lose that. And I think, you know, one of the dangers to the misapplication of singularity level technology, which I touched on earlier in terms of this vision of the, the hive minded Borg society is uh, a misguided attempt to make us quote unquote as perfect as animals. In other words, to have a kind of like a beehive version or termite colony version of human society where there are no, there are no mistakes, as you put it, where yeah. there's no longer any dissonance. Right. I mean, and, and to the extent that there's anything recognizable as music at all, it's all as perfect as the chirping of birds. And I think that would be an utterly horrific nightmare. I mean, that's like the worst dystopia I could imagine, right? And uh, instead, what I would propose and, and what I do uh, discuss in, in my novella, Artemis Unveiled, is the future possibilities of using advanced technology, including AI, to incorporate the songs and uh, communi communicative sounds of various animals into our music, like to start to decode whale song and learn how to produce whale song and incorporate it, for example, into our own musical compositions and develop a kind of uh, chimera hybrid music that's partly animal, you know, and uh, not entirely uh, human.
Interesting. The closest we There's... were able to get to was uh, uh, Who Let the Dogs Out by the Baja Men, but uh, Steph. <laughs> Sorry, the... Steph. There's a just on this point because it's actually a very fascinating thing to think that like the birds have innate ability to sing which is sort of true but not entirely true like they actually learn their songs in some sense but it is also innate so like when they're young they have a very simple version of the instinctive song for their species but then they actually develop it into they almost like like professional singers crafted into their own identity or their, their way of doing it over their adult life which is interesting in and of itself humans have something similar like we have a sort of platonic capacity for melody inside of us and you i've seen experiments with bobby mcferrin experiments but bobby mcferrin goes onto a stage and he he like does this with people where he brings out people's ability to sing naturally even people who think they can't sing by teasing out the sort of um mathematical it's called the the I forget what it's called, but it's this sort of breakup of how how notes work in intervals. You know, like we you give somebody an, a note and they will produce these harmonic intervals no matter what's going on. So there's sort of something very innate with this. And I, as Jason said, our ability for learning and free will and our ability to be just so abstract allows us to do this to a much profounder degree than um than how most people can. You know what occurred so to me listening to you uh, right now is uh, it would be really interesting to splice a gray African parrot with one of these birds that uh, de develops all this, um, you know, um, novel iteration of their, of their programmed bird song. Like one of these, like, I don't want to use the word inventive, but, you know, a, a species of bird with highly elaborate bird songs mm -hmm. to splice that genetically with a gray African parrot, which has been proven to be more intelligent than chimpanzees. And which you can you can teach language to, and they can they'll communicate with you. They actually understand grammar, and they can you know communicate with you in human language once you teach it to them. Because then we could see if we could uh, sort of engage in musical collaboration with a bird that's like as intelligent as a five year old, and that has capacity to produce this uh, beautiful song. Well, yeah, like a bird. There's, there's also a spin on this as well. That's very interesting is that why do they do it? Like, do they do it with a consciousness mm. that it's art or do they do it with a consciousness that they're going to get a like bang, a good looking bird chick? You know, like, is that what's going on? Like, why do they yeah. do it? I, that's, well, that's a very interesting the thing. Probably the latter in the yeah. case of almost every species yes. of bird. But I have my doubts about the gray African parrot. And I'd like well, this to is... test it in a laboratory. <laughs> This is as well because music for humans is obviously actually very much the same motivation. Like we do have obviously a bit of lust inside there as well. But there comes a point where it becomes artistic. And is there something in the bird when he's like trying to innovate and all that, that it, it's like there's the joy of art happening in it, even though there's a more fundamental instinct. Mm. And especially if you got a more intelligent one, could, oh, could you well, see something like we that? We have a comment. Very interesting question. We have a comment from somebody who I think is close to Jason named uh, Archeon because uh, of the avatar there, uh, uh, who says peacocks sound quite awful, ironically. <laughs> I guess you can't have both. Like, you got to choose which one is going to be the evolutionary pressure. Is it going to be to have, like, good-looking, you know, whatever, is, or is it going to be to have a uh, melodious uh, sound? I don't know. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. It's very, I thought yeah. it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, I wonder whether we would have to choose between those in, you know, in the world of gene splicing and CRISPR, right? I mean, uh, clearly the, the structure of the neck and uh, head of a peacock is related to why it sounds so awful. But you can reproduce the colors of a peacock and its feather pattern in a type of bird that produced very melodious song. And, you know, I'm all for experimenting with these things. Yeah. This is, this no, is kind of this... Luciferian shit that Noah's world <laughs> Well, this this actually brings up an interesting question related to the transgenders that we were saying earlier, because I was sort of pointing out that these technologies are going to show up. And what's at root of the transgenderism? It's just it's not very interesting for an awful lot of it because it's like a little bit pathological. But there is something profound inside of it, which is that like I've got this body. But I don't need to have any loyalty to this body because inside I've got this mind or soul or something like this that can imagine a different conception of myself. And I'm allowed to impose that conception upon myself because I own this body and I can do what I want. And that starts to get like, all right, now we already do that with things like clothes and constructing our identity, our accents, 
our manner, the behaviors we do. We create a person. We sort of create somebody when we do this stuff. Now, give the power of technology 100 years with CRISPR, gene editing, longevity drugs. And we have this problem put in our feet where we will get to the point where we can do a lot of stuff and people will begin to speciate. Because if you give a young kid 50 years to develop himself, he might get inspired by Conor McGregor and want to become a fighter. And so it's just all testosterone. It's all advanced dopamine so we can react faster to punches. And he morphs and transforms into this like eight foot super boxer. But then if you give it to a little Beethoven, he'll actually do none of that stuff. He'll adapt his fingers to become longer and he'll do all this crazy stuff. And you'll pretty rapidly see mankind begin to split off into the, all these different forms. And then um, that that's something when you think about it that like just nobody is mentally prepared for at all because we we're constantly throwing around these yeah. this story that we're all the same and, and we're all one mankind and, and there's and also the most important thing for like political order but it's like if in in 50 years if what i just said happens it, it's just like the identity of a, of a person is just just fucking blown out the what we have species of of intelligent people floating around at that point it's very very bizarre and there's also a risk that jason was alluding to earlier that at that point What's to stop the human becomings from being stuck as human beings in the very real way of now being stuck as this Beethoven Pokemon weird thing, you know, that can only do like bait, like they know how to make music, but they don't know how to do anything other than say their name otherwise. So it's just like Beethoven, Beethoven, and they just compose the music. That's how Pokemon <laughs> came about. You know, Pokemon, you know, they have all these abilities, but they can only say their own names. But anyway. Any thoughts on that? Then we gotta go because this yeah, is no, a, but like is a, that's a good, yeah. that's a really interesting question <laughs> because you you, spe of, you specialize you sacrifice you know yeah this kind of genetic specialization yeah. and the potential speciation of humanity due to genetic engineering is a subject that I started dealing with in my second book like years ago in World State of Emergency uh, 2017 I was engaging in a in a consideration of that from you know the perspective of of regulation and you know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, human evolution. So, so yeah, it's these are serious questions, which, as you said, Steph, nobody really is prepared for. And, uh, you know, we better get our act together, at least as a directive elite that can offer some subset of humanity uh, sagacious guidance as we uh, enter the technological singularity, because otherwise we are on a one way track to trad feudalism. Unless we beat the trads, but then when we start getting all artsy with our, uh, you know, uh, Beethovening, then we have all these Beethovens who are just composing music out in the wilds, and then the Nordics come back, but now they're like the Pokemon trainer, so they throw the ball, they catch the Beethoven Pokemon, and now they have the Conor McGregor Pokemon fight the Beethoven Pokemon. Anyway, final thing from Philip Daniel, because he's a friend of the show, uh, he asks, uh, Jason, if you know the music of Oliver Oliver messian a pronounced messian which is based on bird song just want to throw that one in there no i don't and i definitely would be interested in looking into that all uh, right yeah. yeah there we go all right everybody thank you so much for watching once again where can all the wonderful people find uh, you uh wonderful people so uh steph where can people find you Steph, yeah, you can find me on Uberboyo on YouTube or uberboyo.com. Either of those would be fantastic. And uh, thank you very much for your time here, Lev, for organizing it. Mr. Jason Giorgiani, thank you for your thoughts. Thank, thank you, brother. You, Steph. Thank you. As, as always, you are the most wonderful interlocutor. And I look forward to many future conversations with you. Fantastic. Well, we'll talk about how we can create the spindly fingered Beethoven yes. man. And then we, we'll create another, I don't know, Mozart man, and we'll make them fight each other and see who wins. We'll, we'll do something like that. Uh, Jason, uh, where could the good people find you? So I uh, finally just um, revised my website. It was out of date for a while. And uh, people can uh, find links to everything else, my, my books, videos, Twitter, et cetera, there. JasonRezaGiorgiani.com. I think you put a link in the show description, Lev. Mm -hmm. Yeah, JasonRezaGiorgiani.com. Yeah. And also here is the poster once again for Psychotron. When's that coming out? It should be within a week or two, maybe a couple weeks at most. So please uh, keep your eye out for that. Check my Twitter and uh, my other platforms. Um, I'm mostly not on Facebook these days, but check my Twitter definitely. And there's a link again to that through my website. 
Excellent. And guys, you could follow me on Twitter, now known as uh, X at uh, Lev Poe, L E V P O. And I also have a funny feeling that there's a lot of people in here who, you know, because they like to go into the murky waters of the underworld, are also active on Discord, which is why, guys, go to the BTR Discord server. Here is the link. Be sure to follow that. And also levslens.com. That is my substack or leftpo.substack.com, either one. I write about a lot of very interesting uh, things and not in any particular bandwagon as right now we are currently uh, being, you know, filled up in, you know, one bandwagon or the other. Uh, there's going to be more live BTR events. If you guys have not checked out the last stream that I had with Jason, it was live in New York City. The audio quality is it was uh, really good. And uh, you guys... If you want more of these live BTR events, and I would definitely love to do another one with you, Jason. And Steph, when you get to New York City, I would definitely love to do a live one with you as well. If you guys want to be VIPs to those events, you have to become a patron, a $20 patron at patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. You're going to get the VIP treatment not only there, but we're also going to have New York City-based hangouts. I want to meet you guys, take you to all kinds of very interesting places, get to know you. And it's not just going to be based in New York City. BTR is going to be going all around the world hopefully soon. But the more support BTR has to grow the more sooner we're going to be able to do all those world tours. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be well, wishing you the best. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, click the bell. The bell is extremely important. So is the like. And yeah, subscribe to the show. And next week, you're going to see the Peter Bogosian uh, versus Oren McIntyre stream. Be sure to look out for that. You're going to see it right as soon as this stream stops. So be sure to set a reminder. 